three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Live, he's nationwide on CBS Sports Radio. This is the Zach Gelb Show. Here's your host, Zach Gelb. So yet not overly ostentatious Phoenix Convention Center. This is the Zach Gell Show, coast to coast on CBS Sports Radio across all the great local CBS Sports Radio affiliates, Sirius XM, Channel 158, the free Odyssey app, and of course streaming live on YouTube, youtube.com slash CBS Sports Radio. Second day here from Phoenix, Arizona. We get closer and closer to the Final Four, which will commence on Saturday night. And obviously you do have Alabama uh, with their quest to try to get to the national championship game going up against UConn. And then on the other side, the battle of the bigs between Zach Eady of Purdue and also DJ Burns of NC State with their magical run. So we're broadcasting you from the Phoenix Convention Center today. I got Samter here on site with me. And uh, back in our New York City headquarters, we got Stuart Kovacs in addition to Manny Rodriguez and also our on-site engineer in Dan Silverman. A whole lot to do today, 855 212 for CBS, 
4227. You can always get at me on Instagram where I'm straight flexing or via the good old cesspool of Twitter at Zach Gelb. That's Z-A-C-H-G-E-L-B. We got a ton to get to today. Uh, joining us live on the show will be Dan Munson. We will have Bryce Drew. We'll also see uh, Fran McCaffrey stop by, Andy Enfield, the new head coach at SMU, and Mark Pope as well. And right as we got on the air, I did see from our pal John Rothstein of CBS Sports that there is a new hire, and the Must Bus is reportedly on the move from Arkansas, as Eric Musselman has reportedly landed the gig at USC. So we'll see what that means for the future of Bronny James as well. By the way, uh, we are sponsored by Werner. Werner is the official ladder of the NCAA March Madness and the official ladder of construction professionals everywhere. Reach new heights with Werner, available nationally at the Home Depot. So I got to start the show off with this, and it's from Andrew Marshan who is a media critic and a media insider and a media reporter. Um, but it has to do with college football. And there's one thing in this story, and it's nothing with Andrew's reporting. Let me be abundantly clear about that, because the last thing I need is Andrew Marshan to start slamming Zach Gelb uh, in The Athletic. But there's one thing in this reporting by Andrew Marshan that I absolutely despise and I absolutely hate, and it's future college football playoff expansion to 16 teams. Currently, we know that we're going to get ready to embark this year on a 12-team college football playoff. Inevitably, in the next two years, it's expected to go to 14. And then shortly after that, not only could we see it go to 16, but we could see a larger, drastic change to college football as we once did know it. So this is the bombshell, let's just say, headline and article from Andrew Marshan. College presidents and top executives have devised a super league to transform college football as they believe the current system is doomed and headed for bankruptcy. That's what insiders do tell The Athletic. So, you know, when I was in college, I was not great at reading long uh, papers and books and things like that. And there was this website called Spark Notes, and you would go to Spark Notes, and it would basically trim everything down for you. It would condense everything so lazy people that wanted to get into the radio business like yours truly, that were not interested in reading all these ridiculous books that they would make you read that had nothing to do with help you with your profession, but you had to pass the class and you had to go by my philosophy of C's, do get degrees, that you can kind of condense the reading and the actual hard work and get a good enough gist and a good enough understanding of what was going on so you could write your paper, write what you needed to do, present what you needed to present, and have enough information without really doing the work. So I'm basically the Spark Notes version here. I'll tell you what you need to know so you could pass the test from this Andrew Marshan article. Basically, it is talking about the 130 FBS teams that are currently actively participating in college football, and it would be a new system and a new structure where everyone would break away. All 130 of those teams would break away and they would form this super league for just college football. And it would only be college football. So the way that this would work is there would be, for the easier side of understanding this, Division I and Division II out of the 130 teams. And there would be seven divisions of 10 teams. And that would consist 70 teams total. I know I'm not great with math, but at least I could do that. And the 70 teams that would be in those spread out through those first seven divisions, 10 each, those would be all your traditional, normal, as you know it, power five teams. And they would never be in danger of getting relegated. And I'll explain the further part of this in just a bit. And then there would be an eighth division. And that eighth division would basically be the, the, the 10 uh, remaining group of five schools that are the best. And then from that, you would have division one, where it would be the 70 power five schools through seven divisions, and then that extra eighth division where you could have teams move down and move up through time year by year. Now, everyone else that is not out of those 80 teams in the 130 would practically be in Division Two, and Division Two would be the rest, the have-nots for just the easier way of saying it. It would be the rest of everybody else that was participating in Division One football as we know it, FBS football as we currently know it, and that's the way that the system will work and through time those schools can move up into that eighth division in division one so i know that's a lot i know it's tough to understand a little bit but that's where 
it's nothing that's sealed, signed, and delivered. It's nothing that's set in stone. But that's something that is being pushed right now. I'm okay with that idea. Like, I'm not a big soccer guy. I'm not Samter and Stu that will just slobber all over soccer. But I understand the soccer model for this. I'm just surprised that this is already being talked about right now. Because usually, and I know it would be breaking away from the NCAA, but just understanding college sports, they move very slowly. They move like molasses. They move like me in my 40-yard dash time. And I didn't expect the thought of this change to be out there this quickly. And we've talked about this before with RIP practically to the Pac-12 and there only being four power divisions anymore. It already had a sense in just those four conferences when you look at the ACC, when you look at the Big 12, the SEC, and uh, the Big 10 when it comes to football only. Remember, this is a football only conversation. It already felt as if it was the haves and the have-nots. And for the most part, it was the Big 10 and the SEC is the haves, and then everyone else is the have-nots. Ultimately, I did think that this would truncate into college football really being a three-conference sport where it's the Big 10, it is the SEC, and then it's everybody else. But this idea, through the reporting of Andrew Marshan, would be that all the 130 would be included. They would be their own entity, and that's how it would operate moving forward, and it would be broken off basically into two divisions where, let me just make this clear, the 70 teams that were a part of the Power Five, they're never in danger of falling below to the have-not category. So they would be grandfathered in. And I have one little gripe with that. If you're one of the 70 schools and through time you show you don't belong and there's group of five schools that have been better and maybe they should move up, well, I have no problem if they end up usurping you. Like, I don't think it, this should be a half ass thing. If you're going to go to this format where you could get relegated, I, I think that this should be all in, not just protecting the power five schools, but it probably comes back to the brands and the money and, and, and all that. But my biggest takeaway from this and maybe it's just me because I feel like at this point I am standing like on a mountain and I'm, I'm waving a flag uh, pretty much all by myself. I was irate when this article came out yesterday, not because of the system, because like I said, I, I thought we were going to get truncated potentially into three conferences. Maybe at one time it just be all under one umbrella and this would be the drastic shift to this. But they're ruining college football. Uh, that's what they're doing right now because everyone's panicking with the transfer portal. Everyone's panicking with lawsuits. Everyone's panicking with name, image, and likeness. And there's all this panicking going on from people that have been with the sport for so long and they're refusing to change. They're refusing to adjust. They're refusing to adapt because this all goes back to the root of the issue that for so many years, everyone legally got a piece of the pie in college football, but the players that were actually participating and this system you know from what I was reading it would provide a little bit more clarity and name image and likeness players would get paid and all that and I'm all fine for that stuff but college football is still a beautiful thing and you could mess with a lot of things in in life and a lot of things in sports in this world you know when we live in, in America there's something that we could all agree on and it's the beauty of football and it's the love and really the religious type atmosphere that football does have in our country. And I hate when we make changes that don't make sense to college football. And that's my problem because with this, I don't think college football is broken right now. People say college football is broken, college sports are broken. No, you just need to kind of open your eyes. You need to find a way to meet people in the middle and understand that it's a, it's a different format. And we now are living in an era of player empowerment. And I get it, right? The NCAA, college football playoff, everyone is chasing a bag. Everyone is being greedy. And in any sport, if you give people more of a chance to make more money, they're going to do that. But I've sat here before, on this show before, I've sat here on CBS Sports Radio for years, and I've said, do not expand the college football playoff. I've already lost that argument. I'll tell you when I lose an argument. I still think I'm right, 
I don't think that we should be going to 12 teams. I don't think we should eventually be going to 14 teams. And in this new system, if it does happen, and it's a long ways away from happening, it's just floated out there what other people are talking about. So there has to be some juice. There has to be some energy behind this. But we're talking about potentially going to 16 teams. If that's the case, I don't want to see a cupcake on any of these college football teams schedule. I don't. Because there's never been a year outside of this past year where anyone has ever seen the need to go to four, more than four teams of the college football playoff. There's never been a year outside of this year. You know, you want to tell me go to six? You want to tell me go to eight? That's fine. Going to 12, which is going to come your way starting this year, is a joke. So now we got to reward schools like Penn State that don't beat the big boys like Michigan and Ohio State, and they get backed in just because of the brand of Penn State. And there's another example. I get it. Penn State sometimes a pinata on this show. I'm fully cognizant of that. But that's just one of the schools that we didn't need to see more of. And that's what's going to happen in a 12-team format. And I said this when we, it was sealed, signed, and delivered that we were going to 12, that this is just the beginning. And that's why if they were going to move the college football playoff, make it an incremental move. Go from four to six. Go from four to eight. But don't be a jackass and don't be a greedy pig and go from four to 12. And then right away, boom, it's already going to 14. And in this new format, it's going to 16. It just doesn't make sense. It's just, it's what happens in the society now where we're no longer looking for the elite. We're no longer looking for greatness. It's okay, you show up, you know, you're okay, you're average, and we're going to give you more of an opportunity to try to succeed in the college football playoff. I love the college football regular season because every game matters. And when you start to go to 12, when you start to go to 14, when you eventually start to go to 16, and it's only going up from there, you're going to devalue the regular season. And it's a flat-out joke. It is a flat-out joke. And you take away from these important rivalries that have made college football, that creates the passion within a fan base. So through all this deep dive that Andrew Marchand did release yesterday, and I have no problem with the idea of college football breaking away and forming a Super League, but my biggest problem is right away buried in that article is that Hey, it will be 16 teams in the, in the playoff. The eight division winners and the eight wild card teams. And that's just way too many. We do not need eventually 16. We don't need 14. We don't need 12. Six or eight as most. And I'll sit here and I will bitch and complain about this for years and years and years and, and more on. Because it is going to really ruin what we know college football as it is. And that's a shame. It really is a shame because the regular season games aren't going to matter as much as they once did. And look how many times we sit here in sports and we complain about bad products in the regular season. And my biggest fear, and I know it's football, I know there's always going to be passion, we're going to love it, is that college football is eventually going to turn into the NBA. Where it's like, all right, the regular season, who cares? Nothing really to see here. Rather pedestrian and just wake me up when the postseason starts. And that would be a travesty. An absolute travesty if it happens, but this is what transpires when we all know sports, which they make a ton of money, especially football, and they keep on looking for more and more money. We continue to provide more and more opportunity and more and more chances for teams to get into the playoff, but to drastically change the structure as we've seen in recent years, it's just way too far. It's just way too many teams, and I don't think going to – 12, 14, 16, whatever it's eventually going to be. What is it? One day going to be 24? <laughs> it, 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 it's just way too many. And I, and I said the same thing for March Madness. You know, I'm okay with the way that March, like, I, this may not be popular because I'm sitting uh, in a room right now where there's a bunch of stations that are coming here to cover the final four. But I'm, I'm fine being the minority on this one. 68 teams is enough. A bunch of us just parachute in to the, uh, to the college basketball, you know, po postseason tournament into March Madness. And this is everything that I would not want to have happened into football. And after three weeks, it, it's been enough of the tournament. When you start adding more than 68 teams to the tournament, you once again make the regular season irrelevant. And the regular season's already relevant right now in college basketball. But that's what happens in sports because of money, because of the dollars. We just keep on adding in more and more to the postseason. And I really think it takes away from the sport, even though the money keeps on going up and up and up. All right, this is Zach Gelb's show on CBS Sports Radio. We're broadcasting to you live today from the Phoenix Convention Center. We'll be here today and tomorrow from 3 to 6 
p.m. Eastern across all of our great local CBS Sports Radio affiliates, Sirius XM, Channel 158, the free Odyssey app. You can always watch us on YouTube, youtube.com slash CBS Sports Radio. We do have a loaded guest list today. Bryce Drew is going to be stopping by, Dan Munson, Fran McCaffrey, Andy Enfield, Mark Pope as well. So a lot cooking here from the site of the Final Four. We will take a break, and when we come on back, why Stephon Diggs is the right move for the Houston Texans, but it could also one day turn into the wrong move. I'll tell you why when we come on back in five minutes. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining.
30 seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Zach Gelb Show is on the air across the nation on CBS Sports Radio. Here's Zach Gelb. Using your phone while you're driving could kill someone. Put the phone away or pay. Paid for by NHTSA. It is the Zach Gelb Show coast to coast on CBS Sports Radio. We know yesterday uh, the big trade did go down between the Houston Texans and the Buffalo Bills. That did see the Stephon Diggs era come to a close in Buffalo. And now we'll see his third team be the Houston Texans and I saw something coming back from break where I don't know if it's true or not in terms of the information that is being given out but if it is true this is something that as Emmett Smith would say it just makes me hot it really makes me annoyed so Deshaun Jackson the former NFL wide receiver was on uh, up and Adams today with Kay Adams and Deshaun Jackson said that Stephon Diggs didn't think the Bills could beat the Chiefs, and that's why he wanted out of Buffalo. So in one breath, you're like, okay, you admire someone for wanting to be part of the reason why you win a championship and you want to go to a spot where you think you can win a championship. But the reason why I kind of roll my eyes at this, and this story does annoy me, is that if Stephon Diggs just would have caught that 70, 75 yard bomb that did occur up against the Kansas City Chiefs, there's a good chance that the Buffalo Bills would have defeated the Kansas City Chiefs this past year. And they would have won that divisional round game. And then they're in the conference title game. And if Buffalo's in the conference title game going into Baltimore, I'm picking Buffalo nine times out of 10 to go take down the Baltimore Ravens. So if that's true, I just think it's incredibly dumb. And it's a poor line of thinking with Stephon Diggs because it takes away any accountability and it makes him say and makes him basically be portrayed as, oh, well, we didn't beat the Kansas City Chiefs when it mattered, so it was never going to happen, and now I need to leave. Where you were in a good situation. Like, the Bills have been right there. They have to make changes, and now they're going to retool, and now they're going to revamp their wide receiving core. But Dalton Kincaid had a good season for them. And James Cook made a big improvement from year one to year two. A lot of people, they're going to rain and they're going to dance. A lot of people are going to dance in the grave on the Buffalo Bills in the last 24, 48 hours. And they're going to say that this parade and this, you know, good last few years is over with. I, I, I fully disagree with that. And the reason why I disagree with that is you have a quarterback next month. He turns 28 years old. Like Josh Allen's still in the prime of his career. Josh Allen still enters next year as a top three quarterback in the NFL. The only two quarterbacks that are better than him are Patrick Mahomes and Joe Burrow. And yes, when it matters, you may not beat the Kansas City Chiefs, but the Bills have defeated the Kansas City Chiefs recently twice in the regular season. So if that's true, that what Deshaun Jackson is saying, that Stephon Diggs didn't think they they couldn't beat the Chiefs, well, Stephon, how about you look yourself in the mirror? How about you take some accountability because you were a big reason why the team didn't get the job done? And your numbers and your second half production, they were, they were atrocious last year. Well, we're talking about Thanksgiving was the last time this guy had a touchdown. But this is the Stephon Diggs playbook. The juice is usually worth the squeeze with Stephon Diggs. In Minnesota, it was worth the squeeze, but then he didn't want to be there anymore. So then you make the trade, and Minnesota benefited from it because they ultimately got Justin Jefferson out of it. The Buffalo Bills, the first few years... It was obviously worth it with Stephon Diggs. But that relationship basically ended two years ago when they lost in the divisional round to the Cincinnati Bengals, and he blew off the media. He was pouting. He was walking away. And then there was some issue that we still don't know the truth, so maybe Stephon was in the right. 
but there was some issue between Josh Allen and Stephon Diggs. And the Buffalo Bills, and I have friends that are on the Buffalo Bills, like close friends, everyone in Buffalo looked at us, whether it was me, whether it was you, whether it was anybody listening, and they looked at everyone that said there's a problem in Buffalo, and they said there's no problem in Buffalo. Like, who are we kidding? Seriously. Everyone could tell you that there was a problem between Stephon Diggs, Sean McDermott, Josh Allen, and Brandon Bean. And the way that you knew that there was a problem was because most coaches, they put, try to put out the fire. And Sean McDermott, if you go back to right when Stephon Diggs left the team, when they were initially reporting, he threw gasoline on that fire. Because he didn't, he pretended like he didn't know what was going on. And then once the toothpaste was out of the tube, they tried to put it all back into the tube and do crisis management. So this divorce was inevitable. I do not fault the Buffalo Bills for moving on from Stephon Diggs. And you can't fault them for acquiring Stephon Diggs when they did. Because it was positive. But going to Houston now for Stephon Diggs, you got to ask yourself this question. Is it worth it? Is this a move, even with all the problems that you know eventually do arrive with Stephon Diggs, is the move worth it? And even though I've been very critical in the last five minutes of Stephon Diggs, this move is absolutely worth it for the the Houston Texans. Because this is a team that they overachieved. They exceed. There was no. I would say that the Texans exceeded expectations last year. That would actually make me think that there were expectations for the Texans last year. There were no expectations for the Texans last year. And the Houston Texans not only won a division, they were in the playoffs and they won a playoff game. And now we look at the Texans where you have two bookends to lead your franchise into the future with C.J. Stroud and Will Anderson Jr. And now you've added pieces this offseason that do enhance your team. From Daniil Hunter on the defensive side of the ball, which is going to make it a lethal one-two punch uh, uh, you know, one-two punch kind of situation with Daniil Hunter and Will Anderson. And then on the offensive side of the ball, you get Stephon Diggs to complement him into a receiving core that already had Nico Collins and Tank Dell coming off the injury. I know Joe Mixon may not have a lot of gas left in the tank, but he is fine for another year or two if you need some production out of the running back situation. And I I don't even think the Cincinnati Bengals wanted to keep Joe Mixon as long as they did, but he's been productive. He's been solid, but clearly the Bengals started to sour on Mixon three years ago when they had Samaj P. Ryan on the field in a crucial moment and a, and a pivotal moment in the Super Bowl. So this Texans team now, they're being aggressive, and I respect them being aggressive, and they're taking risks. And yes, even though Stephon Diggs, at the end of his time in Minnesota and at the end of his time in Buffalo, could be a royal pain in the ass it's still worth it. It is still a risk worth taking. Because here's what's get, getting lost in the conversation. Stephon Diggs, even though down the stretch towards the end in Buffalo, he was no good. He gave you three solid years before that. And in Minnesota, even though we didn't look at him as a great wide receiver in Minnesota, he was extremely productive with the Vikings. So the Stephon Diggs playbook is this. It's a strong start. And he'll give you two or three really good years and now that's going to be tested because he's getting up there in age he turns 31 this upcoming winter and you started to see him decline a little bit last year but he was still 1100 yard receiver last season now the stats weren't as great as the way that they appear and the way that they look at but for a team like the texans you only need stefan Diggs to be good for a year or two because you have a window here where this is an added luxury This is not a move that you needed to make. This is an added luxury for a team that was already a double-digit win team a year ago and a squad that already made the playoffs and won a playoff game. You have the stud quarterback for the foreseeable future on a rookie deal. You have the stud pass rusher for the foreseeable future in the rookie deal, and it's about taking chances. And for Nick Casario, there was a while where it was patience, 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 patience with the Texans, right? Where they would bring in coaches where you knew – They were not going to be there when the Texans were succeeding. Lovey Smith, David Culley. The Texans were in punt, 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 punt mode for a while. 
And then at last year's NFL draft, the Texans said, we're not messing around anymore. With the second overall pick, they took C.J. Stroud, and they aggressively traded up back to three to go get Will Anderson. And that started moving the ball forward with this organization. So I like what the Texans have done this offseason. I think the Texans, who could have been passive, uh, passive, they could have just sat on their hands and done nothing. The Texans said, let's build off what we did. And even though you're bringing in a player that will eventually be disgruntled and will eventually start disliking people in the organization and being a problem, I'm fine taking this risk and eventually seeing it end poorly as long as Stephon Diggs has done what he's always done his entire career, and that's at least given you a few good years. And at least given you two years where you have a number one wide receiver. And that's why for this move, it is a win-win. Because the Bills knew if they waited a year from now, it was only going to get uglier and you wouldn't get much back for him. And I get it. It's not a rich return. You're getting a 2025 second round pick, but it shows you behind the scenes how ugly this thing was getting and how little they probably did portray publicly with some of the things that we already knew that was going on. Like some of those things we knew were bad. They, we knew that it was ugly. We knew that they were messy, but we weren't getting told the entire story. But this trade just reconfirms and reaffirms to us that it was worse than what we actually thought. And the Texans benefit from it. So the Texans swoop in. You get a good wide receiver to pair to Nico Collins. And even if in three years from now we're talking about how this is ugly, we're talking about how Stephon Diggs is malcontent and how this is a messy situation, as long as he puts up the first two years and he balls out, it's a move that you knew what you were getting into, and it is worth it for the Houston Texans. It is the Zach Yelp Show, Coast to Coast on CBS Sports Radio. We're broadcasting to you live today from the Phoenix Convention Center, getting you geared up for the Final Four that will come your way on Saturday evening. We have Alabama and UConn. We have Purdue and NC State. We're going to take a break here, and we come on back. Dan Munson's going to join us live on set, the former coach of Long Beach State. Remember, he was uh, told he wasn't being brought back in March, and then his team found a way to get into the NCAA tournament. So he'll join us on the other side. Let's send it back, though, to our studios first with the latest CBS Sports Radio update. Here he is, Pete McCarthy. CBS Sports Radio. Sports Flash. All right, Zach, this report is sponsored by Progressive Insurance. Drivers who switch and save with Progressive save nearly $750 on average. Call or click today and find out if we could save you hundreds on your car insurance. You want to be in the right frame of mind before heading to Vegas, and the A's will try to do just that. They are exiting Oakland after the season, a relationship with the city and the fans that has become toxic enough that they turn off the replies on social media. The A's will play at the AAA home of the Sacramento River Cats from 2025 through 2027. They then plan to move into a new stadium in Vegas in 2028. Marlins pitcher Yuri Perez will have Tommy John surgery ending his season. The Tigers looking to move to 5-0. They rally for three runs in the 11th, leading the Mets 6-3. Veteran linebacker Kyle Van Noy is heading back to the Ravens on a two-year deal, according to Pat McAfee. NBA's Ion Williamson had x-rays and MRIs on his injured finger come back negative. Williams is considered day-to-day. -day. The Knicks' Julius Randle done for the season. He'll undergo surgery on his dislocated shoulder. And USC is reportedly hiring Arkansas's Eric Musselman as his next head men's basketball coach. I'm Pete McCarthy. Hey, it's Amy Lawrence. Be sure to listen to CBS Sports Radio at home. Just ask Alexa to play CBS Sports Radio. CBS Sports Radio. You're in a five minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining.
four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. This portion of the show is sponsored by the new Hyundai Tucson, available with complimentary class-leading Blue Link Plus. Now it's easy to use your phone to control your Tucson. It is the Zach Gelb Show, coast to coast on CBS Sports Radio, broadcasting live from the Phoenix Convention Center as we're getting set for the Final Four coming your way Saturday evening. My next guest, his team did make the NCAA tournament this past year. He's now the former Long Beach State head coach and uh, also was at Minnesota. You remember his great run back in 1999 at Gonzaga, and that's Coach Dan Munson. Coach, always appreciate the time. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, that's a lot of former, though. You know, former <laughs> Gonzaga, former Minnesota, former Long Beach. So 
but I'm here. It's still upright and going at it. So this one was the most bizarre. <laughs> and it's like the awkward conversation. I'm sure 9,000 people have asked you about it, but you basically get relieved of your duties, I guess is the proper way of saying it, but you're still coaching the team and your team goes on a run to the NCAA tournament. You've been around a lot in this sport. I've never seen anything like that. Yeah, it was, it was odd. You know, it, it wasn't, uh, you know, I, 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 we were kind of limped in at the end of the year. We'd had a good year. I mean, we went, we beat Michigan on the road. We beat USC on the road. We beat DePaul on the road. You know, nobody had the other team in the country had a Pac-12 road win, a, a Big Ten and a, a Big East win. And then, you know, we were second in the league, got some injuries and kind of limped in at the end. So I went, actually went, called them or the AD and asked about, you know, my contract was up and at the, after the tournament, you know, if, if we didn't win the tournament, maybe resigning and get a new voice. So it wasn't just out of the blue, but it was out of the blue that it happened that day, you know, because there's no way I was going to resign that day with a, a week left in the season because, you know, at a mid-major, that, that week means everything. And, and and that's what you instill in your team, that we're going to fight till the end. And and we win this tournament and it changes your whole season. And, and, and so it went from one of the worst – uh, days professionally that I've had in my career, but to one of the best days personally, because to go into that locker room and see my team, you know, it's like a parent, you know, you're always pushing them. You're always disciplining them. You're always holding them accountable. You don't really know if they love you until they can show you. And once in a while, the kids will show you and you're like, okay, this is really cool. This is why I'm a parent. The same with a coach, you know, to see the love in that room for guys that to actually tell you that, you know, a hundred times that week when we got got together, it was a special week that I wouldn't have traded for any job. And actually, I guess I did that. <laughs> <laughs> we know your locker room, like you said, is the most important part. Yeah. But then you guys get to the tournament and so many coaches speak out about what happened. I know you don't want to be like the coach that gets all the sympathy. So was that some of that praise for the other coaches, even though it was nice, was a little bit awkward. A little bit, you know, I mean, uh, uh, but, but, most of that was Mark Few and Tommy Lloyd, and that's family. I mean, yeah. we started at Gonzaga together. Uh, you know, we're in the business because of each other. You know, and fa and 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 family's supposed to be upset. You know, they're supposed to talk irrational when when some when one of their loved ones uh, is having adversity. And and I mean, my my, my wife is uh, you know the the mama bear of them all. I mean, she she's uh, ready to you know, put her hands on anybody right now. So so you know, but that's that's how people protect each other. And this is a very tough business it's a great business and 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 we're all really privileged to be in it but i think it's you know we all know how difficult of jobs they are and so the, you know it's a lot of compassion within the industry like you were saying there were questions about your future before the news did come on down but when you're getting ready for the ncaa tournament and your ad comes out and basically says oh yeah we did this in in mind to really get this run and elicit this run and inspire this team How'd you kind of react to that? Because it's almost like saying, oh, I knew this was going to happen, and, and I just didn't really buy it when I heard those comments. Well, I, th I think we all, you know, have an opinion. You know, we all, you know, uh, the kids the kids made it happen. There wasn't an AD. It wasn't me. The kids made that run happen. I just was concerned about them because at the NCAA tournament, they're very strict on your timelines, and you can't get on the court for till there's an exactly one hour before the game. So you get there early to make sure that you get your whole hour. So we got there about an hour and a half before the game. And so the kids had about 30 minutes to just sit in the locker room. So as kids will do, they're on their phones. And that story broke, and it was just unfortunate. So, you know, if it inspired them the, the week before, that's awesome. But it, I surely distracted them, you know, because I didn't know what was going on because I'm not on my phone. And, yeah. and they're, they get emotional and upset. And I'm like, what's going on? They tell me. I'm like – we don't, we've, we're going to enjoy our, our, the most important game of our life right now. We're not going to get worried about who gets credit for it or what we're doing. And, and, and so we just tried to move past it, but most, the most, the biggest thing was unfortunate, the timing of it for our players to get it right before the game. Coach Dan Munson here with us back in 1999. Cause you see NC state they're here as an 11 seed. You guys got to the elite eight as a 10 seed. Now you guys had a, a much better regular season record in 99 than what NC state did have. Uh, you always have confidence in your team, but some years, you know, maybe your team's not capable of going to a level that they end up doing. When in 99, when you're going through that run, did you kind of realize, okay, this is something really special that's humming at Gonzaga? Well, I always say that one of my biggest regrets of my career is the run in 99. And people are like, what? And I said, not, not that, it, I mean, any, obviously it, it was probably the pinnacle of my career and, and, and it happened too early that I didn't appreciate it. Like, like that's what this last two weeks, 
it's so hard to get here that I was not going to, you know, worry about my job. I was going to enjoy the run with these players and, and appreciate the, 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 the journey and the, and the, the blood and sweat and tears that it takes to get to here. And cause uh, you know, 99, I didn't really realize that that's like you're saying today about everybody and, and the story of Dan Munson and the dismissal and the run and everything, mm-hmm. you know, you don't realize that, that, that it's national until you get to something like this today and, and you're going around to, you know, to, to every newscast in the country. And it just, then I didn't really realize that the thing I remember about 1999 is you know, the, there wasn't the internet or the or the cell phones or or the national, and so you didn't realize you're in a, your own bubble as a team. And or those kids were just like this year. We're just enjoying our time together, and we get more free meals and more, you know, free hotel rooms, and we're just thinking it's great. And then we when we finally lost to um, UConn in the in the lead eight game, and and we get land back in Spokane. It was an unseasonably like eighty degree day, and I'll just never forget hitting campus. And people were in the trees and people were lined the streets and you could, the bus couldn't even get to the, back to the, to the Martin center uh, because there were so many people where I'm like, all these people actually watched us. <laughs> you know, I guess you don't realize what, what the power of, you know, national TV does to, to a, a, a run like that, but we didn't realize we just were out there playing together. And that's kind of how the last couple of weeks have been with me and my team. Do you feel like you've coached your last game? I'm not sure. I'm trying. I'm trying to just uh, uh, stay married right now because <laughs> stay, being, being at home right now is not. You know, she's not that fired up about seeing me. You know, all your life out of the transfer right. portal, right? Yeah. So, so you know, I think I got to do something. You know, I don't think I don't think I'm ready to to just uh, uh, hang on the couch right now. But 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 it's to say I'm going to coach my last game. You don't. I don't control all that. You know. I mean. It's not like these these jobs are just they're knocking at the door of a guy that, you know, they, they love coaches that went to the tournament, but but they don't really like guys that got fired. So who, what my value is, I don't think anybody really knows right now. Well, coach, thanks so much for stopping by. We appreciate it. Continue success. Right. Thanks for having me. There he is. Dan Munson joining us on the Zach Gelb show on CBS Sports Radio. Once again, just a bizarre story where you get let go and you still have to coach the team. Your team goes on a run. Then the A.D., starts to take all these ridiculous bows for inspiring the team, and it serves as a distraction before the first round of the NCAA tournament, like he kind of laid out going up against Arizona. Not that they would have won the game, even if the story didn't come out about what the AD said, but it's kind of disheartening when you read things like that. But do appreciate Coach stopping on by. And the reason why I brought up his Gonzaga team back in, in 1999 was now we look at the Gonzaga program as a force and as a power, and I know they haven't won a national championship, but Mark Few, who was on his staff, um, has done just a remarkable job at that university, and they exceeded kind of expectations a bit from where they were going into the tournament. A lot of people thought they were going to get picked off in the first round, but you go back to that run in 1999 where they got all the way up to the Elite Eight. I think they lost like 68-62 to UConn and it was a a close game came right down to the wire you start to wonder when teams believe that they could go on on a run like that because you talk to any coach he'll say he believes in his players you talk to any of the players they say oh we could always believe that we could do something like this but there's a difference in saying it and then actually believing it and you equate it and and correlate it to this year in the NCAA tournament not that in 1999 Gonzaga was as putrid as NC State was in the regular season. They only had like seven or eight losses in the regular season back in 1999. But for NC State, man, like this was a team that was 17 and 14, and Kevin Keats was on the verge of getting fired. Like he was right on the hot seat, and he was on the verge of being let go by the university. And you win five games in five days. And I remember we had him on after their victory up against Texas Tech, and it was right before the, the, the game up against Oakland that they ended up winning in overtime. And I said to him, you know, is your team about to lose their legs? Because you go on one of those runs, five games, five days, you win all five, you get the euphoria of taking down Texas Tech, and you start to say, okay, maybe the squad's going to exhale, and maybe that squad is going to just say, okay, we got as far as we got, and now it's all going to just fall down and, and you were not going to have the energy and the durability 
to be able to go through more. But you look at what they've been able to do. Hey, it, it, it didn't hurt that you get Oakland and you don't get a, another like three or four or five or, or six seed in that range. Like you're not getting a higher seed. So you get Oakland and you survive that game. And then after that, you know, they, they took it to Marquette in that first half. And in Duke, uh, up against Duke, they were the better team. And you've seen the sensation of DJ Burns just kind of form right in front of her eyes. And, and I get it. DJ Burns was highly recruited at one point. But when he transferred from Tennessee, like, no one was talking about DJ Burns when he was at Winthrop. And quite frankly, no one was talking about DJ Burns until t- two weeks ago. Like, we weren't. And now everyone tries to be an expert on DJ Burns, but that's the beauty of this March Madness and of this NCAA tournament. Well, now you'll always remember the name DJ Burns, even if they don't find a way to win on Saturday night, you'll always remember that name because of the big personality, the big smile, and just seeing the way that he plays in the court and this remarkable run that has led Kevin Keats, you know, just when it started in the ACC tournament where you win the ACC tournament and you get a two-year contract extension, but for it to form into this where they beat Texas Tech, they beat Oakland, they beat Marquette, uh, coached by Shaka Smart, you beat Duke, where Duke was looking like they were getting ready to plant the flag in the stand for John Shire, uh, right in the grounds and say, okay, th- th- this is our time, this new era in two years, it's working under John Shire. And I get it, Duke is bringing in big recruit after big recruit next year, so Duke basketball is going to be in a big spot. But this has a Cinderella feel to it. And I know people are going to tell me they're in the ACC, Zach, so you can't call them a Cinderella. Why not? You tell me an 11 seed is in the Final Four? Yeah, that, that's a Cinderella. Now, I know people don't look at Cinderella's as schools that participate in the ACC. Uh, you know, last 20, 25 years, you think it's more so uh, Loyola Chicago. You think it's more George Mason and, and Florida Gulf Coast from years ago. And you could go through those teams, et cetera, et cetera. But this team, it absolutely has the feel. And it absolutely has the makings. And ha- absolutely has the look of a of a Cinderella team so it's a bizarre story it's a fun story it's a great story and it's pretty damn cool to see how this has unfolded and now when you get to these four final teams you know Alabama was doubted get into the tourney NC State it was a great run no one thought they were going to get here to the final four and then you have the two obviously big schools and the two big time players in Donovan Klingon with UConn and we know they've been the team to beat ever since they won the championship. And then on the other side, it's Purdue with uh, Zach Eady and Matt Painter overcoming what happened a year ago where they lost to a 16 seed. And we saw when Virginia lost to a 16 seed, they were able to not only get to the Final Four, but then win the two next games and won a championship. We'll see if Purdue can do that. All righty, this is Zach Gelb, show Coast to Coast on CBS Sports Radio, broadcasting to you live from the Phoenix Convention Center. I think we know who the commanders are taking at two. We'll tell you next. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining.
three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Nationwide on CBS Sports Radio. This is the Zach Gelb Show. All righty, rock and roll inside the Phoenix Convention Center. It is the Zach Gelb Show on CBS Sports Radio, coming to you live from the site of the Final Four that will get set Saturday evening with Purdue and NC State. And you also have UConn, the Huskies, who had some travel problems, but they have made it to Phoenix, Arizona, and they'll be taken up. Uh, on taking on Alabama. So a whole lot cooking still to come. Uh, Bryce Drew is going to join us, Andy Enfield as well, and Mark Pope as we'll be having a bunch of coaches stop by the next two days, today and tomorrow, live from Phoenix, Arizona from noon to 3 p.m. Pacific, 3 to 6 p.m. Eastern. First, let me tell you that we're sponsored by CDW. CDW experts help you get more from your technology so you can do amazing things. CDW, make amazing happen. So Shefty, as all of his friends do call him, Adam Schefter of the ESPN, he was on his uh, podcast, the Adam Schefter podcast, and he said, quote, I think the signs continue to point to Jaden Daniels being the second overall pick, Caleb Williams one, Jaden Daniels two, and then the New England Patriots, dun, 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 would be on the clock at number three with the possibility of taking Drake May. 
It's a somber, somber mood now inside the Phoenix Convention Center because I do not want Drake May on the New England Patriots. I don't. You know what, Samter? Let me ask you this, Mike, because I have been so anti the Patriots taking Drake May, and I would be disappointed if they don't end up taking a quarterback with all the buildup, but I could see when you really don't have much cooking with this organization now where you can make the logical argument to get all the first-round picks that you would get if, let's say, a team like Minnesota or Stu's Raiders or whoever it would be come up to three. So part of it would be bittersweet where it's probably the best thing for the organization, but it's like when you hear all this talk about quarterback, 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 and then you don't take a quarterback, it's just like, ugh, then we really wasted all of our time. But it's going to actually be weird if the Patriots do take Drake May. Because as a football fan, I want my team to succeed. I want my team to do well. I want Drake May to be a stud if he is, in fact, the Patriots quarterback. But I have been so anti-Drake May on, on the Patriots the last month, month and a half. It's going to just be a weird, and I mean a weird transitional period, if, in fact, when we're at the draft in Detroit and we're sitting down and... I have probably a nice glass of uh, vino in my hand or maybe some – I'll be like Aaron Rodgers, right? When he found out that they drafted Jordan Love, I'll put like four fingers into a scotch glass and just fill up that sucker uh, the entire way. It's going to be weird having to embrace someone that I have not wanted to be my quarterback now for the last two months. And, you know, that's the point where hope comes in, where you know it's a no-win situation. Either he sucks and you're pissed – or he's great, and you're like, oh, okay, I was wrong on him. But you have to just kind of like put that broadcaster part aside, mm -hmm. put that prognosticator part aside, and be a fan again and just hope that he's great. I was the same way when the Jets drafted Zach Wilson. I wanted Justin Fields. I thought Justin Fields kind of was like similar to Drake May yeah. in the sense that like he was the number two behind Trevor Lawrence. For two years, he was the number two. And then because of the weird COVID year, he had a couple weird bad games, even though he still made it to the playoffs and played well, uh, you know, he just dropped off of everyone's board and went down to the Bears. And I'm like, why are we going after this kid, Zach Wilson? And I was pissed. Once they drafted him, I was like, all right, I don't believe in this guy, but I want him to do well. I want him to succeed. And that's kind of where you're going to have to be. And at the end of the day, maybe you're right, and Drake May's going to be a mistake. And then you'll, then you'll be able to at least have that win of saying, hey, I was right. Or, better case scenario, you're wrong, and Drake may end up being your next I franchise. I hope I'm wrong. Yeah, exactly. So I, that would be the, I would be so happy to be trolled for the 10 to 15 years of potentially his Hall of Fame career about being wrong. I, I would love that because it means my team is in a successful spot with a great quarterback, but it, it, I have to really lean on you in these next three weeks because no one has experience Bad more about picks. their team drafting the wrong guy than your team. Vernon and Golston, Kyle Brady over Warren Sapp. No, but, but just, just with Milner. the quarterbacks. Oh, yeah. Mark just Sanchez. the quarterbacks. Well, actually, Mark Sanchez, outside of Joe Willie Namath, is, is, could be the best quarterback the Jets have ever had. He went to two AFC championship uh, games. I mean, and Aaron, it's got to be Vinny Testaverde, but, you know, maybe. Uh, uh, fine. Browning, but, Nagel, yikes. But Vinny Hurt. Um, Aaron Rodgers, Hurt, uh, Brett Favre got hurt. Like, you guys had some big names, but the, the players that you drafted, those are the guys that have tortured you for the last 20 years. And through all that, like Zach Wilson, Sam Darnold, you look at Mark Sanchez, even though he wasn't the reason you guys got to two AFC championship games, he was still part of those teams that got the two AFC championships. Yeah, I games. mean, Chad Pennington probably is the best of the first round. Another pitches. guy that got hurt. Got hurt, but he was really good for the Jets for at least a longer period of time than Sanchez. But, I mean, listen, at the end of the day, you're a Patriots fan, and you've been railing against Drake May. But my question, I guess, I have for you is this. Is it more that you think that it's Jaden Daniels or Bust? Or is it just not Drake May? Like, if they stay put at three and they go with Penix okay. or J.J. McCarthy, are you as upset as you are with Drake May? Or is your position, if, oh, if Daniels is Oh, I think I'm even board, more heated. If they go Penix or McCarthy, I, I'm going to need a lot of a lot of whiskey. Okay, so so for you, it's really you just really want Jaden Daniels. Like, and this is Daniels, coming from someone that's yeah, a Michigan fan. For sure. Like, I love J.J. McCarthy as a college quarterback. Right. Can he maybe be the guy on an NFL team? Yes, 
but not in New England. He, he, has, to have, goes, he has to have people around him. Like, if J.J. McCarthy goes to the Minnesota Vikings, yeah. I could see J.J. McCarthy having success. J.J. McCarthy gets drafted by the Patriots. They got nothing. Right. I, I love Kendrick Bourne as an interview. He's right. been on this show before. He's our number one wide receiver right now. All right? Like, the, I, I remember have, those years. Th- this is what drives me nuts with people. Because everyone now says Bill Belichick is this, like, coach that uh, the last few years it was a disgrace, it was a disaster. No, Bill just sucked as a GM. You look at those rosters, it's crazy that it took three years for the Patriots to bottom out. Like, that year where they made the playoffs with Mac Jones, that roster stinks. You, you look at the year where they were 8-9 and nine and missed out on the postseason last game of the season where they lost to Buffalo. That was the, the first game back uh, from the whole DeMar Hamlin unfortunate situation. And you had the two kick returns by uh, Naeem Hines uh, in that game or right, off the, 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 right out of the gate for the kickoff. It's like those teams, those rosters were terrible. And, and I'm not telling you Mac Jones is good, but Mac Jones wasn't put in the right position to succeed in New England because he never had a number one wide receiver. Like you look, look, look at Tennessee. Look what the Titans have done this offseason. I don't know if Will Levis is going to be the guy, but what Tennessee did was they said, we have DeAndre Hopkins, we're going to overpay for Calvin Ridley. We're going to go bring in Tony Pollard, who's fine. Tony Pollard's on an every down back in this league, but they did enough and then also enhanced their defense by bringing in uh, via trade Legereus Steed and, and an offensive coach, even though I like Vrabel better, but an offensive coach and Callahan being their head coach. They're trying to put Will Levis in a position to succeed, and if Will doesn't play well this year, it's because of his own. Like, that's the part of the battle here. The, the reason why I want Jaden Daniels is he, we saw the 40 touchdown passes this past year. I get it, there's risk, because what happened at Arizona State happened at Arizona State, and no one thought he was this great quarterback at Arizona State. But this past year, you saw a quarterback that fits the mold in 2024 that could beat you with your arm but also has the athleticism to go run. And I don't need my quarterback running for 1,100 yards in the NFL, but to have those bullets in the chamber and to have those weapons in your arsenal, it's just a higher upside. And I think Jaden Daniels has a better chance to succeed in New England than Drake May. Like, Drake May, what does everyone say? Not NFL ready. He he can't get on the field in year one. Okay, you want to throw Jacoby Brissett to the Wolves for this year? Fine. That's part of the, the backup quarterback position in the NFL, and you get this opportunity. But is much going to change with Drake May from year one to year two with the situation around New England? Calvin Ridley didn't pick the Patriots because his girlfriend wanted to, to, to not go to Foxborough. Like, who are they getting a year from now? Who are they getting that's going to vastly improve this team? That's why I want Jaden Daniels. Well, so here's, the, here's an interesting question then, because I agree with you that Jaden Daniels can carry a team – that lacks talent better than a guy like Drake May Mm -hmm. and better than a guy like J.J. McCarthy who needs certain guys around them. But the question is, once the Patriots do fill in those gaps, do you still think that Jaden Daniels has the bigger upside than Drake May or those other guys? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you think that he's the better guy with no talent and with talent around him? Yes. Okay. So the way that I look at it is this. If we go through the five quarterbacks that are projected to go in the first round, Caleb Williams is the creme de la creme quarterback. No one criticizes Caleb Williams on the field. It's the toughness off the field. Whether you want to go after him for jumping into the stands and crying in his mother's arms. Like, I don't do that stuff. But people wonder if he could win over a locker room. Caleb Williams' play should put him in a position where I don't care what he does off the field, um, you know, in a legal sense, obviously. He doesn't do anything illegal that we know of. But Caleb Williams is someone that I think he'll be that good and he has enough around him in Chicago that any of these concerns right now, I just think it's fatigue. I really think it's, pro- it's prospect fatigue. I look at Jaden Daniels. That's a guy that after Williams, he has the highest ceiling out of any quarterback in this draft. You go to Drake May. Drake May to me is, let's say, a poor man's version of Josh Allen at his best. But just because Josh Allen was able to overcome some of the issues that he had in college, and he turned it around to get the job done, doesn't mean that that's going to be the case. It, it doesn't mean that that's going to be the case with him. Because we've seen other guys that have come into the NFL and said, okay, if this works, if that works, you could turn into this. But a lot of those guys don't turn out to be Josh Allen. So that's the way that I view Drake May. I think the idea of Drake May is... At his best, he could be a poor man's Josh Allen. But then you know those mistakes that we criticize Josh Allen for? 
I think you see those pop up more with Drake May when it's just like the moment of what the heck is this guy doing on the football field? Now, as for the other two quarterbacks, McCarthy, they're selling you on his potential. And they're saying that at Michigan, behind that big offensive line, behind the two running backs, Blake Corum and Donovan Edwards, that he wasn't put in the position where he needed to throw the football more. And the guy only has one loss in his college career as a starter. So I understand the idea of J.J. McCarthy, but I believe he has to go to a situation that has elite talent around him for everything to come together with J.J. McCarthy. Michael Penix, and I've been a big fan of Michael Penix. What concerns me with him, it's not the deep ball accuracy. He's the best deep ball passer in this draft class. It's everything else. Like, we know the guy's a good leader. We know the guy can overcome adversity. We know the guy is tough. But you go back to that national championship game that I was at, and we know that the Michigan defense is phenomenal and was underappreciated really in that run and then got the recognition late. And they had an elite secondary all throughout the season. But that secondary said, we're just not allowing Michael Penix to beat us deep. And when it came to the middle of the field throws, when it came to the underneath throws, there's a lot of throws that Michael Penix looks lost when you're taking away the deep ball shot and you're asking him to throw the ball underneath. And that's a concern for me. But I think McCarthy and Penix are kind of a little bit similar where, yes, you've seen more with Penix in the last two years should make him a first-round pick. But I believe both those guys, the perfect landing spot for both of them, even though they're different players, are the Minnesota Vikings. Or even the Ra- – like, if one of them – obviously goes to Minnesota, the other one, the Raiders, because at least you have a Devontae Adams. Like, I think Jaden Daniels can survive in this league the first two, three years without a number one wide receiver. Caleb Williams, we know he's going to have Keenan Allen and DJ Moore, but I think he could survive in this league right away without a number one wide receiver. Those two guys, to me, are franchise quarterbacks because they make people around them better, and they could survive without a number one wide receiver early on. But for Drake May, for J.J. McCarthy, for Michael Penix, They need patience, and they need the right roster. And for a fit at three, and I don't always believe in the notion, build the roster, then get the quarterback. Like, if you could get the quarterback, and you can manage him and not ruin him, then go do it. But what I'm saying is, with this Patriots new regime, and with the lack of roster, I think if the pick is anyone but Caleb Williams or Jaden Daniels, and both those guys won't be available, they're going to ruin once again, another quarterback and failed to put that quarterback in a position to succeed. So you know what? I basically just went through a therapy session with you and I figured out what I want to do now. If they can't get Caleb Williams, which they won't, if they can't get Jaden Daniels, <sighs> trade back. Trade back and build the roster or take Marvin Harrison Jr. So at least you have that wide receiver. So when the team stinks next year, you'll be in the, at the top of the draft and, and maybe get Shador Sanders and coach Deion Sanders. Imagine that taking over one Patriot place. So that's where I'm at right now. Uh, Michael Fry, who is uh, kind of our checks and balances in the YouTube chat, youtube.com slash CBS Sports Radio, says, Gelb, I'm going to video this and send it to you in four years. Drake May will be the best QB in this draft. Just wait. Uh, Michael Fry. Let me tell you, Michael Fry. I, I have studied your football takes the last three years. I, I have listened to your Ohio State propaganda, and it's been wrong, wrong, wrong. And more wrong. If he ends up being right about Drake May, I would be glad, glad. I'd be thrilled. I'd be doing somersaults in the streets, all right? I'd be jacked up if I have my next franchise quarterback. I just don't believe Drake May is the, is the right and next franchise quarterback of the New England Patriots. All right, we'll take a break here on the Zach Gelb Show on CBS Sports Radio. Uh, before we do take that time out, let me just tell you that we're sponsored today by Marriott. Take your game day rituals on the road with Marriott Bonvoy. Over 30 hotel brands for every kind of fan. Discover more at MarriottBonvoy.com slash NCAA. Bryce Drew's going to join us next. It is the Zach Gelb Show on CBS Sports Radio. You're in a five-minute break.
Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds.
Now back to the Zach Gelb Show. All righty, back inside the Phoenix Convention Center. This is Zach Gelb Show, coast to coast on CBS Sports Radio. This portion of the show is brought to you by Wesley Financial. Stuck at a timeshare and one out? Contact Wesley Financial Group now and get a free timeshare exit information kit at wesleyfinancialgroup.com. Now joining us, the head coach at Grand Canyon. He, of course, is Bryce Drew. Coach, thanks so much for stopping on by. How you been? I'm doing great. Welcome to town. Hope you're enjoying uh, your trip to Phoenix so far. Well, we were actually talking about you two weeks ago. We had uh, Christian Leitner on, and we were talking about the great shots in the NCAA tournament, and he goes, yeah, whoever that kid was from Valpo, <laughs> yeah, he was pretty good. You know, all these years later, with how much that moment not only meant for you, but also your family and for so many people, how do you kind of relive it? Yeah, you know, uh, at the time, I remember we were staying at the Holiday Inn in Oklahoma City, and uh, we were 11 a.m., I think the first, very first game of the whole tournament. And um, after the game, we went back into uh, to the hotel, and they actually showed our highlight on ESPN. And we were so excited. They were actually showing us, uh, you know, a highlight. You know, never did we ever imagine that, you know, years later they would get to play the play over and over, and we would see it, you know, on CBS time after time. So, you know, what a blessing. Just really thankful for that. Do your kids r- realize that shot and realize that moment? Um, I'm talking about the kids that you coach now. Uh, no, no, no. They uh, they weren't even born, yeah. you know, at that time. And um, we don't talk about it. We don't show it. Every once in a while, you know, we'll have a, have a player and, you know, either maybe his parent or one of his older trainers will be like, man, did you see the shot that your coach made? <laughs> and then they'll pull it up and show them real quick and stuff. So, so it, it, it's pretty funny when that happens. So take me back through this season. You guys made the tournament once again. You guys got um, a victory in the tourney. Just how do you kind to look back and recap this uh, special year yeah you know uh it, it was a blessing we uh we had a couple guys uh tyon grant foster one that you know overcame a lot was out for two years with a with a heart condition um got clear just had an unbelievable year conference player of the year hopefully going to get drafted and um you know we, we were healthy um, our starters started every single game all year long um, which doesn't happen very often. So we had a lot of things really go our way, and um, just a great group and a fun group to be around. Bryce Drew joining us right now. The team they ended up losing to Alabama we know have gone on this run uh, to the Final Four, and they'll go up against UConn. Uh, what was the toughest part about preparing for Alabama? Because it's crazy how quickly the narrative can change going into the tournament. You know, they had some injuries. They weren't playing great. People thought they would quickly be in and out, and now here they are 40 minutes away from beating the championship game on Monday night. Yeah, I think uh, defensively was the biggest thing we saw from studying all their film and watching um, their, their, their defensive intensity and um, was just way, way better uh, starting in our game. And, um, you know, I think they, they, they uh, bought into, you know, playing, um, you know, much tougher defense, and that's helped allow them to get them to the Final Four. They have so many different guys that can hurt you offensively. Um, but the biggest step for them, again, is, is that defensive side. Yeah, and, and that was going to be what was either going to make or break their NCAA tournament, and, and they've made some timely stops, obviously, to get to this point. But offensively, like, how do you even try to prepare for them? Because <laughs> it seems like even when teams – contain them they still find a way to break 80 yeah you you know uh Sears is really really good um whatever you see on film he's even better in person he beats you so many different ways and um you know he's kind of on a run kind of like Jalen Brunson was at Villanova you know with the physicality at the guard position his ability just to take over games and in different ways and so um he's obviously you, you know the head of that team and you know, I don't think you can stop him. I think, you know, he's going to score. Um, I think it's important, you know, you try to limit some other guys and uh, limit their offensive rebounding. I think that hurt us, and they've been good all year at that. That's something that gets overlooked. Um, they shoot a lot of threes, so you get a lot of long rebounds. They have a lot of guys that can go in and get the ball. Going into this tournament, as Bryce Drew joins us, I was talking about UConn, and I said, if anyone keeps it within 10 points with UConn, I would actually be surprised. that They kind of reminded me of that Villanova team from a few years ago where they just yeah. beat everybody by double digits and it wasn't even close. Do you expect this to be a down-to-the-wire game, Alabama and UConn? Uh, you know, I, I do. Um, you know, I think it's definitely two different styles. I want to say UConn's 315th in, um, in, in uh, pace and tempo, and, and obviously Alabama's one of the top teams in the country at getting up and down. So, um, you know, will UConn be able to play their pace or will get to Alabama's pace? Uh, Alabama's so scary, though. Again, they, 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 we held them to 72 points, their lowest point total of the year, and they still won. So it shows they are capable of winning a lower-scoring game. So um, I think it will go down to the end. And at the end of the game, usually matters who makes shots and who doesn't. And um, that's probably going to determine it. You talked about your moment, right, in the tourney. And you got back to the hotel and you, you see it on TV. The sensation that has now turned into uh, DJ Burns, uh, that to me is still the beauty of this <laughs> tournament where they're 17 and 14, coaches on the verge of getting fired, 
five days and five uh, uh, five wins in five days. They win the ACC, and now here they are in the Final Four, and everyone's loving DJ Burns. Oh, it's it's it, you know what are the odds you know of that a month ago? If people would have said that, everyone would have said you're crazy. Like, no, yeah, like, like, like no <laughs> the way. coach probably would have. Yeah, like said no it. <laughs> no way does that happen. I mean, five games in five days is remarkable in itself, but then to bounce right back and win two more games in the next week right yeah. ahead of you. Uh, pretty remarkable. And now they beat good teams now. It's not like they're beating good teams. I mean, they're beating really good teams. And uh, it does just add to the excitement. Again, this is the time where legends are made, and he's becoming a legend right in front of our eyes, you know, in the, in the last two, 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 two to three weeks. And obviously to get here, you have to go through two weekends. But to go through that run, and then they still had legs to get out of the first and the second round. Yeah. But then you I, – I know you're not taking a week off. But you're basically not playing for that that week. I thought maybe that's when even they got the rest of the legs would give out, but their legs have been going the whole way. It's, <laughs> it's crazy. It's been going the whole way. So um, if if you've been on their bandwagon, I wouldn't get off now. <laughs> like uh, they beat a lot of teams they weren't supposed to beat in the last uh, last three weeks. And then another part of the Final Four is obviously Purdue. Uh, we saw when Virginia lost to a 16 UMBC. Next year they come back, they get to the Final mm-hmm. Four, they win it all. To see Matt Painter and Zach Eady. They have overcome what happened a year ago, but now to be here, it's like, okay, you got a chance to go win this entire thing. Just uh, as someone that has been through ups and downs in this sport, to see them overcome a tough time, what does that mean to you? Yeah, we're really happy. Uh, Matt's such a great coach, such a great uh, person. You know, he's done things the right way for a long time um, and really happy for them and, and them being in the Final Four. And, and you know, they're definitely, um, you know, here to win it. Um, you know, it's their first time in, like, in a while here, but um with with Edie in the middle I don't think you're you're out of any game um like he showed you know in the in, in the last ones we were 14 in a row off I think in a row and so if he does stuff like that um I do see them in the championship game um and they're actually my pick to win it all right now but by the way what is the greatest run that you've ever had like the other night when we saw UConn go on a 30 to 0 run I, like Donovan Klingon, I was talking to him earlier in the week, and he said, we didn't even realize what the number was. We just knew that it was pretty damn good. That, that's unbelievable. Um, you, know, you know, I don't care who you're playing or what level. You know, when you're that dominant that you can go on a 30-0 run, let alone against a really, really good Illinois team, um, it just speaks how, how, how impressive your group is. You know, we've probably had a 20-0, something like that, or 15-20, to 20, but 30 against a good team, I mean, that, that's really unheard of. Last thing I want to ask you, because you've seen college basketball from many different angles, right? You're the son of a coach. We we all know what your brother's been able to do in this sport. Name, image, and likeness, the transfer portal. How do you kind of navigate through these waters right now? Because we think we know a lot, but then there's a lot that we don't know, and there's a lot that even you can't even prevent going on right now as a coach. Yeah, you know, um, I I, I think the game is changing. You have to adapt. Um, It's not going back to how it used to be. Um, what I would love to see is just uh, as things kind of um, uh, switch to this modern era, you know, of how, how it's going to be moving forward is we just get a set of rules that match what the game is. And um, I know the NCAA is working hard on that. Hopefully in the next 12, 24 months we'll have a really good set of rules that, that we can, you know, with the NIL, you know, with the portal, you know, we can really get a clear path that can stay consistent, you know, for a time period. Right now it's like every six months a new rule comes out yeah. and you've got to shift gears and go a different direction. It will be really nice to just get a set, you know, blueprint of, hey, here's how it's going to be for the next, you know, five, ten years, college basketball. All right, I'll end you on this, Bryce Drew, because your brother will probably text me and, <laughs> and uh, eviscerate me if I don't ask you this because I know he's a big foodie. We're here in Phoenix, Arizona. You welcomed us to town. What do we got to eat? There are so many good options here. You know, uh, a lot of good local places. I, I like a little local spot called Chula's. It's a seafood place. There's one in San Diego. There's one here. Mm-hmm. Um, really good, uh, really good seafood. Uh, Buck and Rider. Again, I like seafood. You can tell. Buck and Rider is a really good place. And then they just have a lot of really good traditional places. Hillstone, Houston's can't go wrong with any of those. Is like I'm a New Yorker, so we have a high standard for for pizza. Yeah, I know you do. Is uh, <laughs> is that Pizza Badia place? Uh, what is it? P- Pizzeria, Pizzeria yeah. Bianco. Sorry, yeah. that was a Philly place pizza. But well, well, is it worth the hype? Yeah, I'll tell you. Uh, well, Jerry Colangelo, everyone in the basketball world mm-hmm. knows Jerry. Um, he is Italian, and so you know, Italian is uh, you know, pizzas <laughs> in, in that category. He, that's his ultimate place right wow. there. So, um, so if that gives you any hint of how good it is, um, it is excellent. I also, I'm from Chicago. I know you're oh, okay. New York. So they have Melnati's here. I, I love Chicago. Is that pizza. real pizza, Chicago? Pizza? Uh, well, you're gonna say that, but I'm gonna ask the no, same I'm about just New a- York. I'm just asking. <laughs> I, I'm not. I was actually defending Chicago pizza the other day. I'm just asking if you consider that real pizza. You know I do. I, but I get the thin crust action. I know people all like the thick. Oh, so but you're I, not even I, a deep dish guy. I'm not even a deep dish guy really. So when I was younger, I was. Now I'm older. I got to go thin crust. Yeah. So, so, so I, I 
might go the thin, but uh, well, there is some New York here, but I would say wait to New York till you go back to get the New York uh, gotcha. to get the New York pizza. Well, continued success. Appreciate you coming on today. Hey, thank you. There you go. Bryce Drew joining us, the head coach at Grand Canyon. It is the Zach Gelb Show, coast to coast on CBS Sports Radio. Let's send it back to New York City headquarters. Standing by with the latest CBS Sports Radio update. Here he is, Pete McCarthy. CBS Sports Radio. Sports Flash. Well, Zach Stephon Diggs will be motivated beyond being cast off by the Bills. The Texans have wiped out the final three years of Diggs' contract, allowing him to become a free agent after this season, according to Adam Schefter. They also move his guaranteed money to this season. He'll have more than $22.5 million guaranteed in 2024. The Eagles agree with left tackle Jordan Mailata on a three-year, $66 million extension. 48 mil is guaranteed per Schefter. Linebacker Kyle Van Noy is returning to the Ravens on a two-year deal, according to Pat McAfee. Someone who won't be strapping on pads anytime soon, NC State big man DJ Burns Jr. Burns told reporters of his interest in playing football, zero. USC has hired Arkansas's Eric Musselman to be its next head men's basketball coach. Baseball, the A's will spend the 2025 to 2027 seasons in Sacramento before making the move to Las Vegas in 2028 if all goes to plan. The unbeaten Tigers defeat the winless Mets in 11 innings, 6-3. The Marlins' Yuri Perez needs Tommy John surgery. His season is over. So is the Knicks' Julius Randle, who needs shoulder surgery. I'm Pete McCarthy. Jim Rome here, coming up Friday in the jungle. Big day. Conversations with Baltimore Ravens, Derrick Henry, and Justin Matabike. See you Friday, 12 noon Eastern and 9 Pacific. CBS Sports Radio. You're in a five minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Two 
two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Now back to the Zach Gelb Show. All right, it is Zach Gelb Show on CBS Sports Radio. We're sponsored by Duluth Trading Company. Duluth Trading Company stacks your starting lineup with higher performing gear all year round, plus keeps all your zones covered and comfy online or in store. Get into Duluth today. We're inside the Phoenix Convention Center coming up in the next hour. Really do appreciate that conversation with Bryce Drew, the head coach at Grand Canyon. We'll have Leonard Hamilton, the coach of the Florida State Seminoles, Andy Enfield scheduled to join us, uh, the head basketball coach of now SMU, jumping from USC to SMU. And reportedly, uh, you do have the must bus, Eric Musselman, going from Arkansas to now USC. And uh, Mark Pope, the head basketball coach at BYU, all scheduled to join us in the next hour. We'll be here today and tomorrow at the site of the Final Four, Phoenix, Arizona, getting you set. For the men's final four, Purdue, NC State, UConn going up against Alabama. I don't know about you, Samter, but it is a little bit bizarre. <laughs> and I know Nate Oates probably won't like when I say this, but when you have a school like Alabama who for the last 20 years, I know it's more than that, but really for the last 10 to 15 years with Nick Saban, the only time we really have talked extensively about Alabama, it's football, football, football. I know Nate Oates has done a good job, and the Brandon uh, Miller story obviously – uh, which was an unfortunate story, and there was a lot more to it last year was something that we did have to discuss. But nine times out of ten, uh, when we've talked about Alabama in the last 10 to 15 years, it's been about the great football program. It is weird now in this transitional period where I think Kalen DeBoer is going to be a stud at Alabama as their head football coach. Where the last few weeks, it's really been basketball-driven, basketball-driven with Alabama. And whenever I say Alabama on, on the radio, I always feel compelled to be like, Alabama. And it has that association with football, and you get set, you know, on those SEC Saturdays. And now to be talking about them in the basketball world, two wins away from hoisting an NCAA championship is kind of crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, you know, you talk about Kentucky and football. There's schools that you would just associate with certain sports. Well, and Kentucky's I get a football it. school. Yeah, apparently, uh, yeah. Rem remember how uh, Mark, Mark Stoops, Stoops and Calipari were he, he not needed an climbing. apology from John Calipari when John Calipari told the truth that they're a basketball school. Yeah. You know what's going to be funny? Someone's going to be listening to this, and they're going to hear me on the radio say Kentucky's a football school. I'm going to get a tweet later or a, like an Instagram message. What are you, moron? 
sarcasm, people, if you couldn't understand that one. Just throwing it out there. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you. I mean, listen, at the end of the day, everybody's a football school. If you have football, you're a football school. Everything else, Duke is a football school. Even though they're college basketball, they're still No, a they're a basketball school. Everybody's a football they school. They care, the, the money-wise, I understand the importance of the football program, but Duke is, is a bat. Like, I think of... Duke, in our mind, Duke is a football school. Uh, is a basketball no, school. No but offense to, to Drake May and, and Mac Brown, UNC basketball school. Kentucky basketball school. But the money is more there for football, and those big TV contracts is what heightens the which awareness is why they're all football schools of, of those programs. Yeah. And sometimes the basketball school even has to apologize to the football team, even though they're still a basketball school. Yeah. I mean, listen, you know, it's all semantics, but Duke's a football school. So, uh, real quickly before we get to a Zach Gelb show PSA. This is from Adam Schefter. There are added incentives for Stephon Diggs as part of the Buffalo-Houston trade. The Texans also wiped out the final three years on Diggs' contract, giving him the ability to become a free agent after this season. League sources tell ESPN the Texans also took the $3.5 million guaranteed to Diggs next season and moved up into this season, giving him a raise and assuring him of $22.52 million in guaranteed money in 2024. But if Diggs plays the way that he wants, and Houston hopes he will, uh, hit the free agent market next offseason with the ability to make it count, Houston now anticipates getting the best version of Stephon Diggs. So this is a little weird because he had multiple years left on the contract, and now he has the ability to be a free agent after this year. Like, why are they – they just traded a second-round pick in 2025 – for Stephon Diggs, I, I know now we are more player driven, but I think the Texans kind of just realize if Stephon Diggs isn't happy, even though he could put up good stats, he'll turn into a malcontent. And let's just make sure we get through this year where they're going all in. And then if he has a great year and he gets the free agency, if you can't afford to pay him or someone else outbids you, then you have to deal with that. But I don't love getting out of this deal now and just wiping away the next three or four years of the contract. That doesn't really make sense to me. No, and if you need to uh, incentivize Stefan Diggs by, by making this a contract year for him so that he's going to play harder and not complain and, and put his best effort in so that he can get the most money after this year, mm -hmm. then it was a mistake to trade for him in the first place. Like you said yesterday, I agree with you. He's probably on the back end of his career. Yeah. He's still a good receiver, but he's not as good as he was two years ago. And if you have to incentivize him, and, and here's the other thing. If, if this was a team like the Jets or a team like the 49ers or so, mm -hmm. a team that had a veteran team that was building for now, I would understand this move. This is a young team with a star on the defensive side, a star young second-year quarterback. You got Nico Collins. You got young players everywhere. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to go all in for one year with Stephon Diggs? And if he decides, like, you know, I just don't like Houston, or, like, the coaching staff isn't giving me the ball enough, he's gone. He could leave. So there's nothing holding him back. So you basically made this move for one year with the hope that maybe you guys can keep him longer. It tells me two things. Two more things on this. Number one. So he was originally under contract and not expected to become a free agent until 2026. Right. So this tells me that even the Texans have some skepticism about the long-term future of Stephon Diggs. And that contract and that money wasn't going anywhere. Now, I don't know the exact terms of the deal, but the guy has earned a top wide receiver contract. So that tells me, even though most people are going to look at how we just looked at it, oh, they just want him to be happy, and then he'll hook free agency and get one more big payday, whether that's from him or somebody else. But this tells me that the Texans know he probably only has one or two more great years left in him, so they didn't want to be stuck to the rest of this contract. And the other part is the Texans going all in signifies this. The last two years, what have we said about football and what have we said about the AFC? That the Chiefs are vulnerable. And the Chiefs have been taken to levels and been dragged to basically the edge where it looks like they're not going to win. And then right when you're about to throw them off the cliff and say they're not going to win the Super Bowl, they come back from down 10 against the Eagles. They come back from down double digits to the 49ers, and they've been able to, to win back-to-back -back Super Bowls. But I think the Texans are saying it's not that crazy for us this year to go win a Super Bowl. So we'll go all in this year, and we'll have Daniel Hunter with Will Anderson, Daniel Hunter on a two-year deal. We'll bring in Stephon Diggs. We'll trade for him. 
and then allow him to hit free agency after this year because they think they were just scratching the surface last year where they were in the second round of the playoffs, and now it's about quickly advancing while you're still on the rookie contract of uh, C.J. Stroud. And listen, I mean, good for them for having that kind of faith in a second-year uh, quarterback with – you know, a second-year head coach. Good for them. I love. Do you when, think it's crazy for the Texans to be in the Super Bowl next year? I don't. I don't think it's crazy, but I certainly wouldn't mortgage the future for it if I'm the Texans. But are you mortgaging the future? It's a second-round pick in 2025. Yeah, I mean, listen, that's not a big deal. You're, you're a second round team picture, this year. Second-round picks are big enough deals. You're right. It's, they're not mortgaging their entire mm-hmm. future. They're not giving up everything for no. this. I get it. But it's still it's a risky move for a one-year thing with a second-year quarterback, a second-year coach, and a second-year defensive rookie of the year. Yes, I love what Houston is doing. I think that Houston has a chance. They're going for it. Yeah, but, like, this is a team that could be building a dynasty. Not a dynasty. This is uh, a team. Pump the brakes. Sorry, can sorry. I, can I get to a Super Bowl first? It, it, it was too big of a word. <laughs> this, is a team that's build, this is a team that's building for now and for the future. This is a team that can be good for the next decade if C.J. Stroud yeah, is as good as you have think. the quarterback. So why are you, like, pushing so hard for one year when – the teams that build properly. You want to te- know why? The Texans have been building properly. You want to know why? They build long term. It's because you don't have the luxury in the NFL anymore to try to dictate when you win. This is now an opportunity with Mahomes in this league and how dominant he is. You don't know how many years Mahomes isn't going to win the Super Bowl. Like, he's not going to. Big take. He's not going to win the Super Bowl every single year, Patrick Mahomes. Tom Brady didn't win the Super Bowl every single year. But there are some teams that were able to win in the years where Brady didn't win. And there will be some teams that will be able to win in the years that Patrick Mahomes does not win. And you got to be ready when that moment is. And the odds are, even though the Chiefs can very easily go back to back to back, the Chiefs probably won't go back to back to back. So you Those have my boys. Don't, don't you besmirch my boys. You have an opportunity to strike this year, <laughs> and the odds are in your favor. Because I ask you right now, who are the three best teams in the AFC? Everyone's going to tell you the Chiefs and the Bengals. That third spot is up for debate. And why can't it be the Texans? And why can't the Texans maybe be a two seed or, or even the one seed and find a way to get to the Super Bowl? So I appreciate them realizing their window is now on a rookie quarterback contract and you're going for it and they're all in. Uh, I'll just say this. I don't even think it's up for that much of a debate. I think the Texans are the clear-cut number three team, especially now that the Bills oh. have lost so much. I thought the Jets were one of the best rosters in football. The Jets. On oh. paper, the Jets roster is as good as anybody else's except for the 49ers. But there's coaching, there's, a, there's, mm-hmm. there's teamwork, there's a, a variety of things. Health. I'm not saying the Jets are the third best team. I'm just saying their roster is up there. But as far as team-wise, I think the Texans, after the Bengals, and honestly, you can even put the Texans above the Bengals. I wouldn't no. be surprised if the Texans... The, the Bengals have lost some stuff, and Burrow's coming off of another injury. They still have T. Higgins. They still have Jamar Chase. And, yes, Burrow's coming off an injury, but he's coming back. They lost Joe Mixon. They lost eh. Tyler Boyd. Their defense is not quite where it was. I'm just so good. I'm just saying the Bengals might not be as good as we remember them being when they had. Tough Cause, division. Because even though Burrow was healthy last year, they weren't great when Burrow was healthy last year either. So I'm just saying. He was never healthy. Started the season injured. Yeah. Then but, came back. They finally started to get things moving. And but he then was there, that was He it. was there for at least, what, five, six, seven weeks he was there? He was fi- And the team was just not doing great. They were looking better before he got hurt for the season. But they were still not, not the second best team in football. All right. We got to get to a Zach Gelb show PSA. Let's hit it. It's a Thursday. What do you have to say? It's the weekly Zach Gelb Show PSA. Who's with me? Let's go! Come on! And the Zach Gelb Show PSA is brought to you by NHTSA. Using your phone while you're driving could kill someone. Put the phone away or pay. Paid for by NHTSA. So the other night, Shohei Otani hits his first home run with the Los Angeles Dodgers. And the baseball goes into the stands. And a fan did the right thing. What a lot of people would say, oh, do the right thing, do the right thing. And you give the ball back to the player and you get something for it. Now, whoever the fan was reportedly got back a bat, a baseball, and two hats. And I'm assuming this stuff was signed. Now, this isn't a record-breaking home run. This isn't a historical home run. This is the first home run in a Dodgers uniform. So I don't know what the market value is for the baseball. 
but don't we live in a world now where everyone shames everyone and doing the right thing and doing what's in the good spirit of human nature? And here you have a fan that wasn't greedy and had every right to do so, didn't cash in, didn't demand for some ridiculous things for the baseball, and just simply said, hey, give me a, a bat, give me a baseball, and give me a two hats. That's all they asked for. And now this fan, whoever this fan is, is getting shredded on social media. It's not your baseball. Here's my PSA. It's not your baseball. It was the person who caught the baseballs, you know, baseball, and they're allowed to do what they want to do with it. And I don't think we need to shred that person for doing what everyone says we need to do, which is the right thing. So that's my PSA. All you losers today, shredding someone for giving a baseball back to Shohei Otani and not getting a King's Ransom for it. Find a hobby. Find something better to do. Every time someone does the right thing, they get shredded for it. And then if they didn't do the right thing and ask for something outlandish, we all be ripping that person as well. So the person couldn't win. Samter, what's your PSI? I mean, Otani's making $700 million. He can't give more than two bats. It's all deferred. Bat- what are you talking about? It's Fine. all He's deferred. He's making 40-something million a year. He can, he can <laughs> handle it. All right, so here's my PSI. You know what? <laughs> Maybe... <laughs> Maybe it was the Ipe Muzahara money. There it is. Maybe you lost all the money. Just like, no, here's Maybe all I can have afford. The funds anymore. It's a fake bet. This is you know. It's I a have Ripple sympathy bet. for Shohei. So here's my PSA. I was reading a tweet the other night from Chase Daniel, former NFL quarterback from Missouri. He says, "You can't tell me Michael Penix Jr. is not one of the top three quarterbacks in this year's class. And if you actually broken down his film, if you say any different, you don't know ball. Mm. Okay, the draft is a crapshoot." Everybody has their own opinions on the draft. Everyone can watch film. Yeah. There are a lot of experts out there, guys who watch film, guys who break down film, coaches, former coaches, scouts, who do not think that Michael Penix Jr. is the third best quarterback in this draft. We've heard from them for months. And maybe he is. Maybe he's not. We don't know. But to call out somebody's credentials and say, you don't know football because you don't think Michael Penix Jr. is as good as I think Michael Penix Jr. is, then you're just an idiot. Chase Daniel and all the other pundits who call other people idiots or saying that you don't know what you're talking about because you don't agree with my take on this guy's film is just wrong. It pisses me off. You know, everyone can have their own opinion. Everyone can see different things on film. Nobody's ever right, no matter how much you think you know about the draft. So just, you know, can it. And also the throw that he used wasn't even that great of a throw. No, Dunze almost dropped it. You know, it got deflected, and then he caught it. All right, Stu, what do you got? Send this home. All right, so basically my PSA is if it's going to rain, don't forget your umbrella because it was an absolute <laughs> monsoon <laughs> when I left time. the office yesterday at 6 Eastern time. <laughs> Uh, the one, and t- the one, two, and three trains were shut down, so I had to re- walk like eight blocks. And oh my god, I got absolutely soaked. So yeah, if it's gonna rain, just make sure you bring your umbrella with you. I, I think we need to implement a system of checks and balances on this show when it comes to the weather. I think Samter, Stu, or myself, whenever it is supposed to rain, one of us have to just inform everyone that it's going to rain because I do a terrible job in checking the weather report. And there's so many days where I don't even know it's going to rain. And then I leave the studio, and it is a monsoon. But, Stu, uh, it seems like you knew that it was going to rain. You just forgot the umbrella, so that's Yep, what you I'm an idiot. I, I, need, I need reminders. I need reminders, okay? Our, our colleague, Tom DeCelestino, refuses to ever use an umbrella. He says that you're a weakling if you wear, use an umbrella. Is that true? Yeah. Well, not, maybe not a weakling, but he calls people out for using umbrellas. Is that like, come on. No, I mean, he's called me. He's made fun of me for using an umbrella. All right, coming on back with Leonard Hamilton. It is the Zach Gelt Show live in Phoenix, Arizona at the site of the Final Four. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining.
3 minutes 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Live, he's nationwide on CBS Sports Radio. This is the Zach Gelb Show. Here's your host, Zach Gelb. three of our radio program from the Phoenix Convention Center. It's the Zach Gelb Show, coast to coast on CBS Sports Radio. We're sponsored today by Werner. Werner, the official ladder of NCAA March Madness and the official ladder of construction professionals everywhere. Reach new heights with Werner, available nationally at Lowe's. And uh, joining us, walking over to the set right now, is the longtime head basketball coach of the Florida State Seminoles. And he, of course, is coach Leonard Hamilton kind enough to sit down with us right now and chop it up for a few minutes as we get set for the final four that will come your way Saturday evening with Purdue and NC State 
and we also have UConn going up against Alabama. Coach, appreciate you giving us a few minutes here. How you been? Well, it's always nice to come up, hang out with you guys during the Final Four. So, hey, thank you a lot for inviting me. Let me start you off with NC State. You guys played them towards the end of the season and uh, got a victory up against them. Now the story, it's crazy how quickly it could change. Uh, 17 and 14 before the ACC tournament. They win five games in five days, and now here they are in the Final Four. How about the job uh, Kevin Keats has done with his squad? I think he's done a tremendous job in, in the climate that we're operating in uh, in college sports. It, to get your guys mentally focused at the right time is very, very important. Uh, we have so many distractions that we'll learn how to adjust to these days for him to uh, have somewhat of a up and down regular season, but it says a lot about his ability to relate to the players, to get them all on the same page here toward the end of the season. Uh, is is this a, a fabulous job that he's done? Uh, basketball has has gotten to the point where there's a lot of parity, so you really don't know what's going to happen from game to game. Um, most teams are very capable. They they are basketball players that have developed all over the United States, and they're all over the place. And so for him to be getting uh, well-heeled and focused at the, at the right time says a lot about him and his staff. We know D.J. Burns is now getting a lot of national attention. He was at Tennessee, then Winthrop, and has landed at NC State. When people talk about him now, they love the personality. They love what he could do on a basketball court. But a lot of people say, hmm, we can't really see him going to the NBA. Maybe he should even pursue an NFL career since you've been able uh, to game plan for him. Just what really stands out to you as a coach when you have to prepare for a DJ Burns? Well, sometimes you just run into people who, who have that it factor. And he has the it factor. And the fact that uh, he has unbelievably, unbelievable touch around the bat, great feel for the game, high basketball IQ, Soft hands, but he has a unique, unorthodox way of playing. If he catches the ball at the three-point line, he's so big and strong that he can back you down all the way to the, all the way down to the lane. And, and if you, if you, people try to trap him, and obviously he finds open guys all over the place, and they have good shooters, uh, good guys who can attack closeouts. And so he's he's great in the system that they use, and uh, let's just call it like it is. He's been basically unstoppable uh, going into the ACC tournament, and now into the uh, to the NCAA's, uh, and now now into the Final Four. He's a handful. And I hope they let everyone play on Saturday because between Edie and Burns, I think the officials are going to be a big factor in this contest. Well, Edie is in a class of his his own. You know, he's a very special youngster that seems to. Uh, have figured out how to utilize his talents to, to the best of their abilities, and he's a handful, and no one has stopped him in four years. What do you think his ceiling could be at the next level? Edie? Mm hmm I mean, it, it's, it's easy to see. I mean, he's, a, he's, he, he's who he is, and if, and, and if a coach can, can come up with a system that fits him and, and – be also complimentary to the other players on the team, I think he, he can, he gonna, he's going to have a special career because what he does is unstoppable. If he catches the ball, he has unbelievable touch. I mean, th there's a guy, when he catches the ball six, seven, eight feet from the basket, he, you know, he, he's probably shooting 75 to 80%. And there aren't very many people tall enough or athletic enough to, to contest his shot. So he's basically sometimes out there on the court almost by itself. <laughs> you know, that's the way it looks sometimes because yeah. he makes it look easy. Leonard Hamilton here with us. You've been doing this for a very long time, and people are wondering how everyone adapts to name, image, and likeness and the transfer portal. Where do you think the game is at right now when we navigate those waters? Well, I, I, I think that my approach has been this. Everybody has an opinion, and sometimes people don't agree with their opinions. Let's talk about facts. There have been so many NCAA rules that we've dealt with over the years that some work, some work out, some don't. I would just like to see more people included in the decision-making process. Um, me voicing my opinion about 
the pluses and minuses of it, I think, makes good for conversation. But I don't think it solves anything. Your opinion against my opinion. I, I, I like to see more coaches involved in the decision-making process so we can see how what the powers that be think relates to what the guys who are in the trenches think. But because of the process that very few coaches are ever invited to the party, we have things developing that sometimes is confusing. And I, I, I listen to people, we should do this, we should do that, and this will be better, and this will be better than this and that. For, for as I'm concerned, um, that's just conversation. And sometimes, right, these conversations and these rules, it drives coaches away. I'm wondering, a coach like yourself, why do you continue to coach? Why do you keep on going at it? But coaching to me is a lot more than just how many games you win on the court, how many NCAA games you play, I mean, how many Hall of Fames you in, how many Coach of the Year awards that you have. And I got plenty of those. It's about taking teenagers and nursing them into young adulthood. You don't really understand the success of a coach until you look four or five years down the road. What are the players that he has coached that came under his tutelage? What are they doing with their lives? Are they good husbands, fathers, neighbors, citizens? You know, what are they doing? I get pleasure when they want to invite me to their wedding. They want me to meet their fiance. They call me on Christmas. Uh, they send me Christmas cards. Uh, Father's Day. I hear from them on my birthday. That's really my reward. All this other stuff that we're dealing with now, it comes and it goes. Um, some I like, some I don't. But it, I'm not going to let it distract me from doing what I think is the most important job that we have, taking youngsters and teenagers and trying to help them grow into the right kind of young men. I know you got to run. Last thing I want to ask you, Leonard Hamilton, where do you think the state of your program is, is at right now? Because it wasn't that long ago we saw you consistently in this tournament. Well, I, th I think I've been affected. I I'm not real sure that I've correctly handled the portal, and, uh, the changes that we've made. And we've built our program basically from – in, within, and I lost six players that put their name in for the draft that I didn't expect to live. I mean, lead, to lose because they just didn't. In my opinion, it wasn't the best decision for them to make. I miscalculated that, and so instead of having juniors and seniors that were freshmen and sophomores, you know, I'm, now I'm coaching guys who've been in. One guy on my team this past season was was a junior. He's been in our program the longest. So we got to rearrange our thought process and, and we have to, you know, develop uh, an approach that's up to date with the current challenges that we have. And and if I was a bet man, I'd bet on us. I like that, that, that answer. We'll that we'll figure it out. Well, Coach, I know you got to run. I appreciate Thank it. Thanks so much for the Thank time. You. Thank you. There he is. He's Leonard Hamilton, the head coach of the Florida State Seminoles, uh, joining us on Radio Row. It is the Zach Gelb Show. And uh, I thought it was a very interesting way in a way that we haven't really heard it before. When you get into the conversation of name, image, and likeness and how we navigate these waters, the coaches do got to have to be included in the conversations more. And you see a guy like Leonard Hamilton, right, who's in his 70s, and you could tell he still has the energy. He still has the passion. You know, I don't know how much longer they're going to afford him the opportunity to do this, but he's still wanting to do this and he's still wanting to be a head coach in college basketball and we've seen coaches get up there in age and they walk away and no problem with it right coach k walked away roy williams walked away i don't think that's the problem when you have a roy williams walk away when you get up there in age when you have a coach k walk away who gets up there in age even in college football nick saban because you could spin it off of okay you're getting older and it's just time but I, I'll say this about everything that we're navigating with name, image, and likeness in the transfer portal, and I'll say it by acknowledging I'm pro name, image, and likeness, and I'm pro transfer portal. I'm, I'm pro with the player having the right.
to make the decision. And sometimes in college, you make the right decision. Sometimes in college, you make the wrong decision. But the biggest problem, the way that I look at it from coaching right now, is that you have a guy like Jay Wright, who Jay Wright, we all know, is doing a sensational job on CBS. And people at CBS probably aren't going to like that I'm about to say this, but Jay Wright shouldn't be at CBS. Uh, Jay Wright is 62, sure. You don't need the stress of coaching, sure. Jay Wright has won two championships. Uh, Jay Wright is in the Hall of Fame. Jay Wright is a legend. But when you have name, image, and likeness, and right, the transfer portal, and the ambiguities that come with it, and that's why Jay Wright is no longer coaching, and he could sell to every once, and I know he's talked about it before, so it's nothing new shattering here, but he's talked about name, image, and likeness, and he talked about the transfer portal. When you have a coach of Jay Wright caliber, and Jay Wright probably still being able to give another 10 years of coaching, leaving to go to TV, and and not wanting to return to the college game ever again. And the only way Jay Wright would return is to be probably a professional coach in the NBA. And I don't think he's going to do that. That shows you that there's some sort of problem with the system. And like how Leonard Hamilton said it, everyone can have an opinion. Everyone can voice their opinion. Everyone can have an idea of how to change it, but it's not changing in terms of once you open the can of worms, there's not going to be anything that's going to significantly alter what we're doing. I just think there needs to be a way that it could be more controlled because there are players that are getting taken advantage of, and they don't even think they're getting taken advantage of. So once again, I'm pro name image and like this. I'm pro transfer portal. I don't have every idea to fix what's going on and, and everything like that, but I'll reiterate this once again. I look at all the moves that have happened as of late. Coach K, Roy Williams, Nick Saban have no problem. They walked away. And they could tell you what they want, and hey, Nick Saban even admitted it. It's because the game's different. Times are different. That's fine that the game's different. That's time that the times are different. But when you have someone that's still younger, like Jay Wright, walking away, that, to me, shows that there needs to be some change. And maybe five, ten years from now, this is a non-issue because you'll get accustomed to it. You'll learn how to navigate it. The older guard will then definitely be out of the sport. And you will have guys now like uh, a Bryce Drew who just joined us. And I know he's at a smaller school in Grand Canyon, but he's been at other stops before. And you have a Bryce Drew who's 49. We're in 5, 10 years when Bryce Drew gets to 55. When he gets to 59, he has already dealt with everything that comes in the name, image, and likeness in the transfer portal. And you just get used to it. And it's the new norm. But it's these waters of the next five years or so, how you navigate it, and there's going to be more changes to college sports and you wonder how you just get everything under control. And I can't make this clearer than I've already made it. For years, the problem was the only way the players got paid was an illegal matter. And now they're legally getting paid. Is the system perfect? Absolutely not. But you either have to adapt, you have to adjust, or you, you sometimes just have to get out of the sport. And if you want to get out of the sport, that's your right. But it's not changing, and it's not going to change significantly in this door was already opened, and now we know name, image, and like this is going and it isn't going anywhere, and the transfer portal isn't going anywhere as well. All right, it is Zach Gelb show on CBS Sports Radio. We're coming on back from the Phoenix Convention Center right after these short messages. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining.
Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Zach Gelb Show. All right, this is Zach Gelb Show on CBS Sports Radio inside the Phoenix Convention Center at Westwood One's Radio Row for the Final Four. We're sponsored by Dude Wipes. Still using TP? Dump your roll because wet cleans better than dry. That's just good science. Try Dude Wipes for the best clean. Pants down. All righty. Uh, rocking and rolling Zach Gelb show on CBS Sports Radio. I do use that product. It is a very, very good product, and we don't need to talk any more about what I use to uh, clean what I need to clean because I can already hear people projectile and vomiting right now on the radio. Santa got a big kick out of that raid. I, I think we should do the next segment and just talk specifically and solely about what you use in that in that moment. I use dude wipes. <laughs> all right, good. <laughs> I'm, I'm not let's, lying. Let, let's get into the details. Let's let's hear all of the. Uh, well, I sit of, down. Yeah. I read a newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> do you, hold on. Do you bring a newspaper in? 
No. Okay. I mean, no, like, no offense. I, I don't know the last time I picked up a newspaper outside the time when we were at the Super Bowl uh, talking to Travis Kelsey. We wound up on the back page of the New York Post. It's the last time I picked up a newspaper. Now, if you haven't heard, I know you're an older man. Everything now is digital. Yeah, no, you consume I'm, things on these things I'm, called a cell phone. I'm the same way. I've got my tablet or my phone with me in, the, in, in there at all times. I could be there for three hours at a time playing my games, watching a movie. But, like, you know, back in the day, people yeah. have a newspaper, and there's that sound of the crinkling in the bathroom. Right? You know. Do you remember the uh, wrestling superstar Taz, who obviously used to work here at CBS Do I Sports remember Radio? him? Yes, yes. I. So Taz like and Taz. I – oh, did you really? Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah. he worked here for long enough. I, you yeah, know what? I Taz, well. Taz and you, I, I feel like, would get along very oh, well. Oh, yeah. Me and Taz were like, you know, peanut butter and jelly. No, because Taz – Taz didn't really like a lot of people here. And for, and for some reason – I had this like I have this ability when people don't usually like a large group of people that they usually find a way to like me. Hmm. And Taz, for whatever re I only worked with him for like two weeks because I, I filled in uh, two times on that show for like a full week. And Taz and I had a, a, a good relationship, all things considered. But I'll never forget talking about reads and commercials and things like this when. <laughs> There used to be a sponsor here on the network, and it was uh, oh, Manscaped. And they would just play like a lawnmower <laughs> in Taz's Manscaped read. And if you don't know what the product is, it's a way for guys to trim, uh, you know, some hair down there. Certain areas very uh, safe. That rhymes. Some hair down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've used it before. It's, oh, it is prima donna. Mm -hmm. Primo. Did that rhyme hair down there? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I guess it I does. I mean, they're not spelled like they rhyme, but they mm -hmm. sound like they rhyme. So, so that was the way that uh, all these years ago, uh, one of those reads when we do a dude's life read, it did kind of remind me of uh, Manscaped as well. All righty, getting back to this Andrew Marchand story, which we delved into to, to start the show, where college presidents and top executives have devised a super league to transform college football as they believe the current system is doomed and headed for bankruptcy. That's what... Uh, Leaders do tell the athletic, and this is a report by Andrew Marsham and also Stuart Mandel. So my biggest takeaway, Santa, from the article, and this is just because of who I am as a human being, it wasn't really the giant transformation that we're going to see to college sports. It wasn't really uh, breaking off into one league. It was in the article, oh, the way that this format would work where it's 130 of the FBS schools, and it'd be basically Division One and Division Two, where the top 70 that were the Power Five schools would be always in the Division One, and you would break them down 10 teams per seven divisions, and then there would be this eighth division, which would basically be the group of five, and that could move up and down throughout the years, where if you're a good group of five school, you get in with the big boys. If you don't, then you get relegated down to everybody else. It would be the 50 other schools that would remain in practically what I like to call Division Two. And I'm reading this article, and I think most people are like, wow, 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 okay, these are changes that people, and nothing's set in stone, nothing's like imminent. But the way that I kind of read it through all of this was there was a line in there where the playoff structure, and it was kind of like a throwaway line where something along the lines of, you know, that means there, there wouldn't be all these debates with the playoff, and it would be based off uh, standings as well, where the only guaranteed ends would be the eight division winners, and then everyone else, I think, would be by who had the best record. So, like how the AFC North some years sends uh, three teams to the, to the NFL playoffs. Like, if you're in the first division and you have a, you know, after that, the eight spots, the best record of 9, 10, and 11, there's no set spot for each division outside of the team that wins that division. And when I read that there would be eight teams in the playoff plus another eight wildcard teams, I, I thought I was going to pop a blood vessel. Like, I was as mad as, the, as when you were threatening to potentially push back your seat when you were sitting in front of me on the airplane where there was no need for you to push back your seat. That's how I was so annoyed. But there's a bigger conversation to have here, and I'll get to that bigger conversation in just a second. But I always find it funny on this show how we have the ability to talk about things and then other shows – talk about things or sometimes like today this marcos valdez scantling interview that we had that did like half a half a billion views on on or half a million views excuse me half a billion oh my <laughs> god i know we create Wait some news here, but hold on this marcos valdez scantling interview that did like half a million views on social media and now every show today and tomorrow is going to talk about it because they were hyping up aaron Rodgers. marcos valdez scantling said he was one of his best teammates but i was listening to our pal uh rich eisen the other day 
and Rich Eisen had Larry David on. Larry, da did you see this clip? Uh, I saw a few different clips. I'm not sure exactly which one you're referring to. Larry David, out of nowhere. I don't know if he's a listener to the show. I am a big Curb Your Enthusiasm fan, and you never know who's listening. But Larry David, unprovoked, randomly, brought up how when you're on an airplane and someone is in front of you, it should be illegal to recline the seat back. That airplane seats should not recline back. So maybe this is a bit on the Rich Eisen show that I'm not familiar with, but I just thought it was very interesting. You don't watch Curb, but that's a part of the Curb Your Enthusiasm. When they play that music and then Larry David stares you in the eyes, I thought it was very interesting that out of nowhere, when Larry David was on the Rich Eisen show, he's talking about the seats going back on an airplane. Yeah, Larry David and I are very good friends. We, he and I had a very long conversation about the seats going back. You know what? Us short people don't get a lot of benefits in this world. Mm -hmm. And if... Being able to have extra leg room because our legs are shorter than yours is one of the benefits, and we can lean our seat back and be comfortable in an airplane, yeah. and you tall people have to suffer because, oh, no, the seat's going back two and a half inches mm -hmm. on your super tall legs of you tall people who get all the benefits in the world that can reach anything that we can't reach. Yeah, we can also hit our they can play on, all the on doors when we walk in. You know what? Cry me a river. Give us short people something beneficial to, to deal with. You tall people get all the benefits, get all the love. So what? You're going to be a little bit uncomfortable on an airplane for two and a half inches of seat on your knees. That's my new PSA. I throw that old Chase Daniel PSA <laughs> out the window. This is my new PSA. Tall people complaining to short people about tall people problems. I don't care. Zach, if we're on the same flight on the way back, I'm moving that seat as far back as possible. Yeah. And I'm going to throw things at mm -hmm. you. I'm also going to flip my like uh my my hood over the okay. seat so it blocks the blocks the, uh, the the monitor of the screen that you want to watch in mm -hmm. front of you i'm gonna just make your trip as miserable okay. as possible because sure people deserve some love too uh we have an open pr pr uh, producer position here at CBS <laughs> sports radio if that seat goes back an inch if that seat goes back one inch Stu. <laughs> Do we know anyone back at CBS Sports Radio that wants uh, to replace Michael Samter? I think there's a few people back here that, that would be open to that, yeah. <laughs> See, I Remember, think... we are in a room right now with other radio shows. Yeah. It will not be tough to find the new producer. I, I will say this. I think the people who want to replace me are more so, not so much they want to take over this position, they just want to get rid of me. So it's more like, <laughs> hey, we can get rid of Samter? Great! I was kind of saying that's why you and Taz would kind of get along. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> a lot of people with haters inside of the building. Uh, you know so, what, listen. So can I make an analogy here? Uh-oh. For, for you trying to defend I, I, see you said it not me but short people and how everything skews to taller people we like vertically challenged you can i can call us short people you can't call us you're short using people. my shtick this is like when <laughs> i say i could call fat uh, someone fat because i'm a large man that's that's you have twisted uh, you used to be able to call yes. someone fat you're not fat anymore so you can't call someone fat uh, anymore yeah but i'm, I'm still big boned all right? yeah, well, i'm still a large human who being. you eric cartman I'm not fat and big bone. I did feel very good, by the way, when I went to the uh, the DXL the other day. <laughs> and they said, you could use this for the tall, but you're not really part of the big Ooh. anymore. And I was like, can you say that again for the people in the back? <laughs> I was like high-fiving the guy. It felt great. <laughs> but I will, I will make an analogy here. Okay. You, you as a vertically challenged person. Thank you. You're kind of like defense now in the NFL. There's not a lot of rules that go in your favor. I so this airplane back and pushing the seat back is kind of like when an offensive player fumbles the ball and it goes out of the back of the end zone. Why I am a proponent of now keeping that is because that's the last rule that actually benefits and rewards the defense. So I think in some way I have to be consistent. You have kind of now turned my, my mind around and my thought process on this around where you should have the right to push that seat all the way back. See, I'm glad I was able to change your mind on the seat back thing but it's frustrating because i'm so in the opposite direction with the fumble out of the end zone mm -hmm. that i don't want that to be well, the, i just uh, played a mind game with you because uh, i know you don't like that so now i either have to agree with you about the football out yeah. of the end or zone or i have to not hypocrite. put my seat back in an airplane anymore it's a lose lose you you're like you're playing chess while everyone else is playing checkers here mm -hmm. i am with my little red checker cubes you know whatever going hopping 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 and you've got like an you got a, a queen mm -hmm. and a rook and you're just knocking me off the board so our boss, who I guess is still our boss, but he's leaving, and it's like the long. This is a longer uh, retirement tour, even though he's not retiring, than like uh, 
uh, Derek Jeter or, do, or Coach do to, K. Do you have to give him a gift like they do on all these retirement tours? <laughs> no, he's leaving on his own accord, right? Yeah. He's taking a different job. He's yeah. going to be a host. It, this is not like he's actually retiring, but it feels like this a retirement This is what the LeBron tour. farewell tour is going to feel like. So It'll just never end. Spike can't stand J.J. Redick. And J.J. Redick now does this podcast with LeBron James. And LeBron was talking how he plays chess a lot. And he's and when he was followed up by it, he's like, oh, well, I don't actually play chess. He was talking about, like, the mind games of playing chess. That's what I was basically doing. I don't play chess, but I do play chess, and I just play chess with your mind. Well, all right. It's, it's called the Queen's Gambit is what I know about. There you, go. you put a chessboard in front of me, I wouldn't even know what to do. I would not even know what to do whatsoever. Note to self, <laughs> challenge accepted. So getting back to this Andrew Marchand story. <laughs> My mind goes in the direction of 16 teams in this format in the playoff. PU, thumbs down. I don't like it. I, That's what I think. The entire first segment of the show, when you're ranting and raving about the expansion of the playoffs, mm -hmm. like that, that was the one thing out of this entire story that you picked up. I'm laughing my ass off because I'm thinking to myself, this is the most significant change to a sport that we've seen maybe ever in any sport. This this change would change and alter the entire. Uh, foundation of college football, the way we watch college sports, and everything to do with the sport that we love. And here you are like, I hate college football playoff expansion. I don't want 16 teams. Yeah. And I'm like, there's so much more here. We're talking about soccer relegation and promotion for the mm -hmm. Cooper 5 teams. We're talking about se uh, uh, seven other divisions and having teams being like uh, geo geometric, uh, uh, geographically kind mm -hmm. of connected together so mm -hmm. that UCLA doesn't have to play Rutgers in a Big Ten game. Right? This is going to be great. This is going to have the haves and the haves not. It's going to separate college football from yep. the NCAA. It's going to lead to more money. Players are going to get paid. NILs are going to be regulated. Transfer portals are going to be regulated. I'm like, wow, this is great. This is going to be such an, a, a unique and amazing change to a sport that we love. It's not going to devalue the regular season because now you have divisions, and winning the division actually matters because there's seven divisions or eight divisions as opposed to just four or five power mm -hmm. five conferences. It's going to matter who wins the divisions. It's going to matter what your record is it's going to matter all these games it's going to be like the nfl not like the nba and i'm thinking all these wonderful things and here you are just like i hate college football playoff expansion yeah because it sucks <laughs> yeah i get it but, but what about all the rest of the stuff so all well, uh, so all the rest of the stuff here's why i'm not like as fired up or as passionate as it because anyone with a brain maybe not this way in the relegation idea i do like that I think it's fun and it brings more incentive and more yes. more fun to the group of five instead of just making it the haves and the have-nots this is a way of kind of you still have the haves and the have-nots, but you still give the little guy a something seat at to the play table. For. And, they're, and they're playing for something different also because, yes, they can win divisions and get the wild card and get in, but they're also playing to not get relegated. Sure, but here, here's the thing, though. I said this years ago. Like when I was working with Hot Take Hickey, we talked about what the future of college football was going to be. And I said two things are either going to happen. You're eventually going to have the Power Five get truncated into the Power Three, where it would be the Big Ten, it would be the SEC, and then it would be everybody else. Or you were going to have it just be the Big Ten and the SEC, they'd break off together, and then everybody else. Or we talked about this exact idea, not the relegation, that I actually, even though I'm not a soccer guy, I would be on board with this if we're going there that way. But we talked about down the road, college football either breaking away or college football just basically being not including all 130 but 70 or 80 schools that were the power five operating under one umbrella and this idea basically went all the way to the finish line of what the sport will eventually look like and they just said let's cut out all this you know mo conference movement and conference realignment that we've seen in the pac-12 going away and things like that and nothing of this is official. It's just been floated out by presidents and some other people in college athletics, and they're talking to, to Marshan and, and one other reporter. And this would just be going right to the finish line, and you still find a way for everyone to have a seat at the table, but there's just divisions, but there's still a chance for the little guy to jump back in. And then also, it, it's going to be the, the scheduling component is my biggest question of this, how the scheduling would work. Because in the way that this supposedly does play on out, it would be 16 teams getting into the playoffs, and outside of the eight division winners, it's not a selection committee that decide the other eight. It's based off record. So if you're playing in, let's say, a tougher division, like how would the breakdown of the divisions go? Like are we still getting Michigan and Ohio State in the same division? It's things like that 
because if you have these loaded divisions where like division one and division two are the top, let's just say 16 teams, my biggest question then becomes, well then how many cupcakes are we gonna have to see in the regular season? That's just the thing to me that I'm wondering how this is gonna play on out. But I'm not opposed to this idea. We just need more facts and we don't have those facts right now. All right, it is Zach Gelb show on CBS Sports Radio. Let's uh, get the latest CBS Sports Radio update and we will get that right now with Pete McCarthy. Sports Flash. All right, Zach, the Texans are laying out quite the welcome mat for Stephon Diggs. They've wiped out the final three years of his contract, allowing him to become a free agent after this season. They're also moving all of his guaranteed money to this season, more than $22.5 million, according to Adam Schefter. The Eagles agree to a three-year, $66 million extension with left tackle Jordan Mailata per Schefter. Linebacker Kyle Van Noy is returning to the Ravens on a two-year deal, according to Pat McAfee. The A's are moving to Sacramento for three years, starting with the 2025 season. They hope to be opening a new stadium in Las Vegas in 28. USC hires Eric Musselman from Arkansas to be their next head men's basketball coach. NC State's DJ Burns Jr. is at NFL Scouts intrigued, but Burns told reporters of his interest in playing football, zero. The last unbeaten team in baseball, the Detroit Tigers, with a 6-3, 11-inning win over the Mets earlier in the Met, in the Tigers with a 1-0 lead on the Mets in the second game of the doubleheader. NBA, the Knicks' Julius Randle needs season-ending shoulder surgery. I'm Pete McCarthy. Hey, this is Bart Winkler. I've got a new show weeknights. Join me for the Bart Winkler Show starting at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific, only on CBS Sports Radio. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. minutes 30 seconds remaining
two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Hey, this is Howie. And this is Nick from We're the Thunder Factory Boys. Boys. And you're listening to the Zach Gelp Show on CBS Sports Radio. And guess what? Zach is back. All right. He's live. He's nationwide on CBS Sports Radio. This is the Zach Gelb Show. We are sponsored by Wendy's, the official hamburger of March Madness. Get a Dave single for just a dollar and a Dave's double for just two bucks. With their offers in the Wendy's app, limited time offer at participating U.S. Wendy's Redeem in the Wendy's app. Account registration required. See offers in the Wendy's app for details. And I think uh, the biggest fan of that rejoin was the head basketball coach at BYU. He's Mark Pope sitting with us right now. I cannot believe I'm on with the legendary Zach Gelb <laughs> with the best intro I have ever heard in radio. And You're making me blush. Jeez. And, and just to double down on that, Wendy's makes the best burger of all the drive throughs Yeah, I know you agree I, that? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I, I know your wife is uh, sitting over there to the left. She probably would have appreciated when you guys beat Gonzaga and you bought the kids all that food if you guys would have went to Wendy's instead of where you well, actually no, did no, go. Well, no, no, no. Cubby's is a local. <laughs> Cubby's is a local joint, man. You would have saved some Cubbies. money. It would have saved a Afford, lot of it'd money. Make daycare a little bit more affordable, Coach. My gosh, I'm pretty sure the owners ran that bill up like crazy, but it was worth it. It was worth it. Well, I appreciate you stopping on by. Let me uh, first ask you, though, going all the way back when you won – uh, the championship as a player with Kentucky still to this day. Just what's the everlasting image for you during that crazy run? Whew, uh, man, there's so many. It, there's so many. I, I remember we were at the Meadowlands, uh, which was it was actually the last year they ever had the Final Four in an arena ever since it's been in a dome. And so it was the tickets were insane and, and the people packed. And we just drove, uh, if you've been there you, from the Meadowlands, you just drive across the freeway to our hotel. And fr from, our ho from our bus door to get to the elevator in the hotel, which was like 30 feet, it took like an hour and 15 minutes. And it wasn't talking to people. It was just human bodies squished together so hard nobody could move. And it was a brilliant moment of mayhem and joy for Kentucky Wildcat Nation, Big Blue Nation. It was pretty fun. It's kind of crazy that because, you know, I live in New York now and I grew up in New York and St. John's trying to yeah. get on back and yeah. your coach, Rick Pitino, yeah. 
he just can't get away. He, he still loves this sport more than oh, ever. Man, and come on, what a gift to St. John's. Like, um, you just can't think of a more perfect coach to have there. Uh, and he is going to crush it. And the reason I know he's going to crush it is because he crushes it everywhere he goes. And, and so it's going to be a really uh, exciting future for St. John's, and, and New York is going to go crazy, and, uh, and he's going to take it there, and it, I, I can't wait to see it. I, I know this is probably weird for you because you're a coach right now, and that's the coaching fraternity, but then Kentucky is your school. Yep. And we'll talk about BYU in just a second with Mark Pope. But Kentucky, the last few years in the tourney, they lose to St. Peter's. And this year they lose to Oakland. A few years ago, they didn't make the NCAA tournament. Uh, you see John Calipari. People are wondering if he's still the right guy. With your knowledge of just Coach Cal and, and the Kentucky program, what are your thoughts on that? Coach Cal is the right guy. He's amazing. Uh, we, we can't, we can't uh, you know, sometimes you, you forget how good you have it. And uh, what he's done at Kentucky has been incredible. Uh, what he does for the community is credible. Uh, the way he's a spokesman for, for everything Kentucky is a beautiful thing. That the, the pros that he's been able to put out. And um, certainly he is not satisfied with um, the championship runs. That, you know, if, if, you know, really at Kentucky, if you don't win the national championship, at least four out of five years, you're going to take a ton of criticism. Uh, but, but he's going to get back there. And uh, I'm telling you, he, I think, he's, a, I think he's, you know, he's, he's one of the great coaches uh, to ever um, walk the sidelines of college basketball. And, and uh, he, he's one of the few guys that could go crush it at Kentucky like he is. And I expect in the next year or two, he's probably going to uh, hang another banner in, 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 uh, in Rupp Arena. Talking to Mark Pope right now, looking back at your season, I know it didn't end the way that you wanted it to with the quick show and the tourney, but how do you kind of reflect on what you guys were able to do this year? It was incredible. Like, I mean, I love competing, and I love college basketball, and, and for us uh, to, to finally make our way into the Big 12, which has been 107 years in the making at BYU, and, and to be able to go compete and share that with our fan base and for our guys to perform – uh, at the level that they did when we walked in with, with you know, the only expectation was that we were going to get buried. And uh, I just, man, it was just such an incredible year. I will remember it for the rest of my life, what these guys did by bonding together. Uh, it was special. And, um, yeah, you know, it, 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 it bring me to tears really quick. Uh, I, I love these kids, and I love what they did together. You guys played NC State early in the year, yeah. and you guys got a victory up against them. Yeah. I know that their program really has taken off, and Kevin Keats has really done a great job in this last month. Did you see signs that that team could do what they are now on the verge of doing, which is playing in a Final Four game on Saturday night? I definitely saw signs of that because in the first 10 minutes, we were down 18 <laughs> against them. And then my guys just turned it on. It was just a three-point barrage to come back and win. But, um, you know, they have really, really great pieces. They have a veteran, veteran uh, leader in the backcourt, really dynamic uh, scores in the backcourt. Clearly, up front, they got uh, one of the most unique players in all of college basketball. And, and uh, I love Kevin, man. Uh, you know, you get a chance to sit down and talk to me. Of course, he's from the Coach Patino family like mm -hmm. I am. And, and, uh, and I love him, and I love sharing stories with him. And, and I love this for him because, it, you know, this is why college basketball is great. A month ago, people were talking about, like, the end of his tenure at North Carolina State. Now he got two-year extension. And a month later, he's an epic legend in the history of North Carolina State. And that's why we love March Madness. That's why we love college basketball. I know you got to run, but it's been pretty cool this year to see the women's tournament yeah. and where that's at, where a lot of stars are in the women's game. But then the men's game, people say, oh, the stars aren't there anymore. Uh, what do you make of the current landscape of college basketball? Because we are at this Final Four. You got Donovan Klingon of UConn. Yeah. You got Zach Eady of Purdue, yeah. the breakout star of DJ Burns. You know, what do you make of the men's game right now with name, image, and like this transfer portal and all the changes? I, I love everything about it. Um, I, I, I love it so much. And certainly stars uh, attract attention. And it might be, not be the traditional path of having a star grow through two or three or four years at, at the same university and college. Um, but, but what makes college basketball different? than the NBA is that um, we love watching players grow for sure. We love it. But these fan bases, they're attached to players that come and go through the program and go, but they're attached to their school, man. When I think about Cougar Nation at BYU, I mean, you know, we're the 10th highest attendance in the country. The Rock is probably the best, biggest student section in the country. 
and uh, that's going to continue on long after I'm not the coach there anymore yeah. and our players go. And so in college basketball, we actually are blessed to be able to go become a part of a university and a fan base that's much bigger than us, mm -hmm. and that's pretty epic. The BYU fan, I, I, I'll give him a lot of credit, and on a national stage like this, uh, all I'll say is, uh, years ago, when I was working in the Princeton area doing local radio, I, I went to a Princeton BYU basketball yeah. game. I couldn't believe yeah. how many folks there were that were BYU fans in Jadwin uh, Gymnasium that night. Yeah, yeah, and the thing is, we don't travel great. We're everywhere. Yeah. Like, if we, if, if we rolled here in Phoenix for a game, like, <laughs> at least half the arena would be BYU fans. They didn't travel from Provo. They live here. You, we go play at Houston or anywhere else, it's, it's, it's brilliant. We're really blessed with an epic fan base, and, and uh, it makes it fun, fun to be a part of the program. Well, Coach, always appreciate your energy. Thanks for the Thank time. You. Thanks, Zach. There he is, Mark Pope, joining us on Radio Row. It is the Zach Gelb Show on appreciate CBS you. Sports Radio. Great to see you, Coach. Thanks so much uh, for coming on, as always. Love Coach's energy, man. Uh, that dude, uh, he, he knows how to definitely uh, talk it up and sell a program, and uh, we've been uh, big fans of Mark Pope, obviously, throughout the years and everything uh, that he's been able to give back to the game of college basketball. But you look back, yeah, they, they were in that, that Vegas Classic, I think it was, or earlier in the year, and they did go up against NC State, and they were able to uh, defeat them, and that was back on November 24th. And think about it. That was on November 24th where they, they won that game, and uh, 95 to 86, and you talked about how they were down a bunch early, and then to see the season that NC State was able to have since then, it's it's once again, I know he was very complimentary to the program and the, and the early struggles that they had in that game, but with NC State, no one, and I don't care who you are and what you claim to know and what you claim to predict, no one would have been able to predict this run of, of NC State. I think actually one person about a week before they did end up going on this run to the Final Four, where he said in the first week it was Jim Beheim who talked about what this NC State team could be. And everyone thought he was crazy. But for people saying they're not a Cinderella, I get it, they play in the ACC, right? We, we know the, the story and, and what, is, what happened with Jimmy V all those years ago. But this NC State team, they're absolutely a, a Cinderella. Yeah, 11 seed, an 11 seed making the Final Four. And I, I ended the conversation with Mark Pope that way because in the women's game right now, there's a ton of stars. Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese, Juju Watkins, uh, Paige Beckers, Paige Buckets, right? There's so many stars in the women's game. But even with how much we talked about there's not stars in the men's game right now, getting Zach Eady here is big. Getting UConn back with Danny Hurley and Donovan Klingon here, enormous. But then there's always the unknown part of the men's tournament in March Madness. People didn't think Alabama was going to be here. But then getting DJ Burns here is enormous. And I'll end the show by saying this. That game, the whistle is going to decide it. And I just hope Zach Eady of Purdue and DJ Burns of NC State, there's not a lot of foul trouble. That's what I hope in that game, and I hope they let them play. All righty, fun show today here inside the Phoenix Convention Center. Big thanks to Dan Silverman, Michael Samter, Manny Rodriguez, and uh, also Stuart Kovacs. Big thanks to each and every morning for tuning in. Dan Munson, Bryce Drew, Leonard Hamilton, and Mark Pope for stopping on by as well. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. We out. Bye-bye. Peace.